Sports won a very different race two weeks ago when we went dirt track racing at the Bristol Motor Speedway. That one was full of unknowns of a different coming into tonight at Dega. Yeah, there's unknowns, but we kind of know what those unknowns are. The question of if you're going to survive all 94 laps tonight, I think, at the forefront. It is Daytona on steroids is the best way to put the Talladega Super Speedway. The bank is just a little bit higher, the track a little bit wider, and also a little bit longer. Talladega has got a reputation throughout NASCAR's history as being one of the wildest tracks they have ever raced on and that they race on to this very day. With that in mind, I would be very, very uh, expectant that we could be having ourselves a very exciting race then here tonight. And I, I like that analogy comparing it to Daytona, right? It's like a large soda in the U.S. versus every other country. It's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit wider. A little bit unnecessary. That is Talladega Super Speedway. And Terry, we're coming into this one as we work through the calendar, getting towards the middle portion of this regular season. Yes, it's only round seven. Yes, there's plenty of time to go. But we're starting to figure out who's strong so far this year. Before we know it, we're going to be past halfway in the regular season. So if you quite haven't figured out this next-gen car yet if you've had some struggles you really need to start to kick it into gear because that figure it out part of the season I think is behind us and now it's time to start executing oh absolutely and you know we had the Daytona duels and you had the Daytona 500 out here for this series but this is the real true test of what you got when it comes to plate tracks and my heart's beating like crazy I've done officials on this track all week long and I've yet to figure out how to win it I've lost it every which way I've hit that commitment cone I've been spun in the trioval I saw Barney the flag man waving that darn thing I grew a mullet out uh, to come to Dega and do it but these drivers are going to have to realize that when you get in this pack, it's a whole lot of unstableness. You're going to have the car start to feel like the back end wants to kick out. You're going to want to go down below that yellow line, but that's out of bounds. There's going to be a lot of comers and goers too. And this could be a place right here that somebody we didn't think was going to win might sneak up and spool the party for some of these uh, bigger names here. It absolutely could happen. You can see Barney the Flag Man looking over the qualifying session now. He's resting those arms because he may be throwing a couple of yellow flags over the course of tonight's 94 lap and 250 mile event. Of course, we'll be back here in Talladega in October for the Battle Beaver 250 middle of round 12 in the postseason. So uh, again, drivers know what to expect, but they don't at the same time. They know what those challenges are going to be. And uh, again, and there's always going to be that age-old question of do you go for it early, do you hang back and whatnot. One thing we're normally talking about, Nolan, at this stage of the afternoon is who is going to be sent home. That was notable because last week at Bristol with a 25-car feature, more than a dozen names didn't get to race for maximum points tonight. 43, as always, the maximum grid size, 42 so far have qualified. So for the moment, unless anything changes in 25 seconds, everybody going to make the show uh, for the first time uh, in a while since Coda. But only by the slimmest of margins, we leave just one spot that's going to be available for these drivers to kind of have a bit of buffer room with. And that really is not a whole lot. When you look back at some of the races previously and you see that we have had sometimes as much as 55 drivers signing up, which means that there's almost 10 that have been sent home at the end of these qualifying sessions. This qualifying has drawn to a close and well, good news. Everybody's into the show for well, one of the first times all season long. That is going to be good news for everybody here tonight. Obviously, if you had more than 43 cars and somebody failed to qualify, they would get five consolation points. But everybody is in the show here this afternoon from Talladega. That also means you can open up a spot to somebody else on the wait list. So we may see a couple of new names competing uh, when we go race it again next week. You know, Terry, it's kind of been an interesting part of the schedule these last few weeks. We've had a race, then an off week, a race, then an off week for the last month and change. This kicks off five straight weeks of racing. Dega tonight, Dover, Darlington, an all-star race, and then the 200-mile race, or 200-lap race, I should say, 300-miler in Charlotte in the middle of May. So these guys have been used to some off weeks. I hope they enjoyed it because this is going to be a grueling middle stretch of the year. Oh, and absolutely. And what better place to come to than Talladega? You know, you, you think about this place, and most people just kind of get scared a little bit. They're like, man, I, I'm going to – my season could – could take a big blow right now well this could be a, a launching pad for somebody to get on a hot streak you win tonight 
it not only do you prove that you got the speed in your next gen car, but it shows that you're smart. So this could be fun to see him go from dirt to Dega to Dover. Who can carry it over uh, in three very different racetracks here on a five race stretch? And we're about to find out because qualifying has drawn to a close and we are ready to say let's go racing. So let's go trackside and take a look at your SK Sim Racing starting grid for the Talladega 250. Liam Sheen is on pole position tonight alongside with Tom Wetmore on the front row. They will bring us to the green flag this afternoon ahead of Dominic Howard, Brandon Bowie doubled up on row two. Kevin King is starting fifth tonight and Agado Phillip will roll from P6, Nolan. Battle puts San Nieto down in seventh with Dane Cruz in eighth. Bradley Burke is going to be starting down there in the ninth position with Michael Johnson in 10th. Jerry Wymaster is 11th with Anthony DeBarro in 12th, Terry. Hey, you get Cody Harris right there in 13th. Right next to him is Jeremy Miller in the 13 machine. Raleigh Grant Davis down there in 15th. Right next to him is Chris Rabel. Uh, Muna TC Majors, I think I butchered that one, but that flying arrows machine looks hot. Spot of five colors. Uh, right next to him is Ross Cato in 18th. Halfway home, you'll find Brian Chambliss and Sean Kalis double up. They'll make up row number 10 here this afternoon. Shane Newen's going to be starting 21st alongside the 38 machine of Matt Danson. Matt Mara is starting 23rd in the 23 Chevrolet. He's ahead of Thomas George, who rolls off 24th. That'll put Redneck Brian in 25th with Brandon Six in 26th. Timothy Johnston is 27th. Andrew Friedage is at 28th with a lot of work to do. Eric Stanford is 29th. Michael Oriatari is in 30th. Yeah, right here in 31st, you're going to see David Cobb. Uh, and then Sean, uh, Sean Casto with William Smith, Kyle Kramer, Nicholas Cohen, and Kyle Trudeau back there in 36th. And the final couple of the drivers, Shane Parrish, Chris Edwards, James, Ro James Ross, and Nick Silver, your top 40, Tom Morano, and Michael Kaczynski. Going to round out through row number 42, and that is a look top to bottom at your SK Sim Racing starting grid. SK Sim Racing is an iRacing team and channel with an emphasis on reaching those who are new to the Oval Sim Racing community. You can keep up to date with them online at facebook.com slash SK Sim Racing on Twitter at SK Sim Racing 1 and you can race what champions race by visiting skSimgear.com. Of course, this Talladega Super Speedway, 2.66 miles in length, a little bit larger than the two and a half that you see in Daytona Beach, Florida. But it's not just there. Banking amped up a little bit more to 33 degrees in the corners. And of course, it's really about three and a half stories tall worth of banking, which makes it a little bit wider than Daytona and possibly a little bit more open to some three wide racing. Well, the base car is going to dive down it in this time. Field in the hands of the 92 Nexus Ford Mustang of Liam Sheen. Second plate race of 2022 and a preview for a playoff race later this season. We're happy that you're with us on Race Spot TV. 92 car looking to take us to it. We're at the mercy of Barney the Flagman as we say, let's go racing at Talladega.
Well, the outside line struggled in three and four. Now the inside checks up back down to turn number one, lap number one, led by Tom Wetmore. But there is not a lot of coordination on the opening lap of this Talladega 250. Three wide through the field already. And once Wetmore led that lap, that is it for him. He will go to the apron and drop to the rear of the field. Race now back in the hands of Liam Sheen. But for how long? Phillip tries to go underneath, can't do it. And three wide still middle of the road. And that is the likes of Chris Rabel up on top, who is trying to find a way through on the high side on a one-man crusade. It did not go anywhere, though, and he's ended up falling back even further than he started. One car makes an aggressive lane change up at the top 10. It was Jeremy Miller who made a huge jump to the inside line. That, again, stacked up the bottom lane. It seems right on entry into these corners, particularly though turn one. That's where the trouble spot is, Terry, with that inside line. Yeah, you start to get some bumps down there. I, I spent, like I said, I spent a lot of time on this track to prepare for this. And I know people think you're just on the gas a ton. You're you're going to be out here. You're full throttle. There's a lot of off throttle time. And when you get this suck in this car, especially in the next gen, and I saw that the Chevys uh, were the ones to really get the pull down the back straightaway and the front. When you get in the corner, you got to bog out of it because if you push that driver in the corner. It's game over. This field's going to wreck. So a lot of checking up here this afternoon. And looks like they've maybe figured things out for the moment. The inside line has an advantage by about five car lengths. Down on the inside, Liam Sheen has settled into that control position after we saw Wetmore get the bonus point for the lap lead and then hit the eject button down the back stretch on lap number two. So inside's going to be the comfortable place to ride early. You can see that gold number 13 car bottom lane. That's Jeremy Miller, sixth in line. He was the driver who had that big scare on the outside opening lap of the race in three and four. That kind of spread everybody out. Then we saw Bowie struggle down on the bottom. So Miller got a little bit of back end damage in that contact but rides pretty good right now there's a good look at his number 13 Chevrolet for one of the extreme performance motorsports teams and uh, he is again going to pull out on the bottom but listen to Miller's not a guy to ride around he's going to go to the outside try to make the outside line go that top side is not going to be stuck seven six car lengths back all night they're going to come and go they're going to get runs they're going to fall back so if you want to ride take the bottom if you want to move get to the outside and so far that does seem where he wants to be is on that outside lane he has so far not shown any signs of backing down and I think now that the initial three wide that you can see off of these starts is over with we'll be seeing drivers tuck it into in the line here for a little bit of two wide action for the most part throughout this race this is what we can expect to see a good chunk of this race being put up with you got some single pile right at the front two wide uh, for a majority of the field maybe a little bit three wide deeper in the field where everybody is still constantly checking up in reaction to all of the moves being made uh, up towards the front of the field very much like what we were seeing uh, just this last weekend uh, in the NASCAR Cup Series. And so far, it looks like it has been a relatively tame start to this race, considering that it is Talladega. That being said, still a long way to go. 89 laps still on the docket. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of patience here. You saw him start to fan out. You know what the strategy is going to be for Liam Sheen at Simple. He wants to lead every lap. Uh, and when it starts to get a little chaotic, obviously you're going to pull out a line. You see him start to snake, try to take it three wide. It's going to put one in the middle here. They'll go three wide down the back straightaway. But by the time they get around about, well, about 20 to go, there ain't going to be no more laying back. Everybody's going to want to go. And this is a 50% race of what you just watched over the weekend with the NASCAR Cup Series. Half-length races, as always, here on a Monday night with the full-throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series. The advantage to the inside continues to grow. The 34 car of Bowie, the lead driver on the uttermost lane, but he's not any better than 11th in the running order right now. And the outside continues to dissolve lap by lap as more drivers pull the plug and decide to dive down. Down to the bottom and really give up on it you need the draft that's the big key here at Dega finding friends to work with finding drafting partners who you know will go with you and certainly I think Nolan that's a time where some of those larger teams you see here in this series will have the advantage right you got several teams that have a lot of cars keep it really sports has got so many drivers they've got two teams same with both of the extreme performance motorsports groups so those groups if they can link up you're talking about seven eight cars working 
together over the course of this early part of the race when we're not really racing for the win we're racing to figure out how these cars are going in the draft who's willing to do what this is the time where those friendly faces are going to try to find each other better to set them up late in the race you can't win it at lap eight all you can do is lose it at this point and I'm glad that you brought up the subject of groups there, Evan, because it also brings up another very good point about when it comes to the strategy side of things, because uh, Talladega racing tends to be a game of chess at 200 miles an hour. And I think what a lot of these teams are already trying to figure out, when are we going to be coming on down in the pit road? Because a lot of those larger groups, particularly the teams that have more than one group, they're going to be coming in together. The, the only way you're going to be seeing drivers from the same team not coming down together is if they happen to be trapped on separate lines and one line can't get down onto the inside lane. There was a bit of a move from one of the team machines to jump up to lead the outside lane. Kevin King wanted to make his move to the front, but that's only going to stack up the outside lane as they had to slow up to allow him time stuck in the line but now they're one car strong and that is allowing them to pull a little bit further up Matt Dancer though having a bit of uh, shall we say some interesting difficulties there and that's stacking up the outside lane as well because nobody wants to be able to find themselves in a bad shape Brandon Bowie's almost going to run over Kevin King in the process as cars scramble to the apron and one car's into the outside wall in the back straight away you got a car back here. They're all they're all strung out here. Everybody kind of lost their momentum. You see the 31s out there. You got to find your friends. And towards the end of the race, obviously there's going to be some cautions. But now you have three distinct packs. You got the single file lane on the bottom, and then you go about a two, three car lengths back, all the way to the 31, and to the gold car down there in the 13. It's now the 31 goes to the bottom. You're going to have to find your friends in low places, and I'm sure somebody's got the Garth Brooks in the background because you don't know who you're going to work with at the in. You could see a, a guy like Brandon and Six up there working with a guy like Ewing. You, you don't know. It's going to be who can get me to the front and who can get me to the win here tonight. It was a tough break for Danson because he's fallen way off of this lead pack after that contact with the outside wall. Danson struggles this year, maybe uh, undersold a little bit for how tough it's been for the driver who, you know, has raced against the likes of Freenosh, the four-time defending champ for titles here in the Cup Series, who has successfully held him off for a championship fight just a few years back in the Winter Series, only as good as 17th headed into tonight. And this is not going to help him at all because he is damaged and he has lost the lead pack at that point there is not much you can do except hope that a lot of race cars wreck out of this race over the course of the night because he's not going to be getting much on his own you saw the 11 to david cobb he was on the outside on his own third lane so he's going to drop behind all these cars kevin king's 31 Bowie's 34 johnson's 39 so he tucks back in line and it's a net loss of a lot of spots for david cobb he falls down to 18th position but he started this race in 31st so overall still in the green uh, but clearly showing that the third lane not an option yet nobody's willing to go up there because the bottom's the preferred lane right shortest way around this racetrack it's going to be the quickest way to lap the second lane is an option but you need cars there right you need even more drivers nolan for that third lane to be an option and i don't think that's really going to come into the closing 15 or 20 because you're just not going to get that many people giving up the the bottom lanes this early Tell you what, that contact with the wall from Matt Danson actually split up the field a lot more than we thought. You used to be first on back to about 30th place. We were all tucked in line at once. Now it's only first back to 22nd. You saw all those cars scrambling below the apron. A majority of those cars now, well, they're trapped in that second pack from about 23rd all the way back to the 33rd position on the racetrack. And then you got 34th on back to 39th. Uh, stuck in a line of their own somewhere down the field and these guys are not going to be able to make up any ground deeper in the field because well the bigger pack will have more speed up in front this has been proven uh, time and time again unless there are again some very major checkups in that front group in which so far no signs of uh, anything quite like that or at least that's severe coming up any time soon still double file though uh, for the meanwhile as we continue to lo log the laps away so this could prove to get a little bit interesting here especially if that second train somehow managed to start to close back into the leaders
Yeah, I think at 31 right there is learning something with the 34 on his back bumper. They're learning how much you can push down the back straightaway. You see this big shot right here. It's a little bit of a tandem, and that's what these next-gen cars provide here at Talladega is it allows the two cars, back what we used to see uh, when Keselowski got his first win at Talladega, two cars go together. You see the pack starting to break up. That little bit of side draft on the side of that 27 there really slowed him down, allowed that 31 to get to run. But a little bit later in the race, you'll see that that middle line might become the place you want to be. Because if you have a third lane out there in the bottom lane and you're side drafting both, you got your kind of staggered columns like what they do in the military. You stagger one on the bottom side on their quarter panel and uh, Bowen pushing you on the quarter panel, the guy to the high side. That middle line gets to rolling, man. It's going to be fun to see. We're either going to wreck them or we're going to have a heck of a finish. Not sure uh, if we've ever made it through a Dega race with uh, all of the cars still in one piece. And we've seen caution-free Dega races, but a caution-free Dega race is not a wreck-free Dega race. They seem to always find a way to do something, whether it's on lap number one or lap uh, you know, 91 towards the end of the race. Uh, they've got uh, quite the ability of tearing up race cars. And again, it's just because these drivers have so many tools at their disposal. They can do so much with these next-gen cars. And I know Terry was talking about pushing Nolan. I think Dale Jr. made the point on the Cup broadcast yesterday, the fact that, you know, looked like some of the Fords were being able to push a lot more aggressively than the Chevys because those Mustangs have a much flatter nose. That Camaro's almost pointed right in the center by the Chevy bow tie. So there are some of those unique things you got to do with. These are not the COTs, you know, from way back when, where they were flat bumpers. They locked together perfectly. So that's what these drivers are dealing with. You've also got people on different internet, different ping. You're seeing, how hard can I push this guy? Can he handle it from pushing him into the corner? You know, can I push him in the center? Can I push him on enter, exit? You know, what is he comfortable with? And, you know, you kind of have to take... Um, kind of body language cues from the other car in front of you, right? If you're on radio, if that's your teammate, he can tell you. As you see Kevin King there in the 31 car, end up three wide in the middle. Jeremy Miller in the 13 machine just about uh, took him out after Kevin tried to go low and the door shut. But that's a good point there. So those guys aren't on radio with each other, right? They're not teammates. So you can't ask him, hey, does this work for you? Howie, does this work for you? You just have to take those signals. How does this car move when you hit him? Does he, you know, push up the hill when you're pushing him that hard? You know, are you losing time, gaining time? Is he wiggling? Uh, that's what this whole part of the race is about, is that kind of R&D session, figuring out what you can do with who, retaining all this info, so when it comes time to race for the checkered flag a little bit later tonight, you know what your options are. There is a little bit of an asterisk, though, over all of that as well. This may be an R&D session, but obviously some of that data you get now is going to be completely null and void when we get to the end of the race. You get that outside lane really on a huge charge right now, and that's because, of course, Brandon Moody has been given a huge job by Michael Johnson. They're up to third, almost a second, now in line with Hagnell Phillip going for the lead. Oh, it's a bit of contact there. Bowie almost gets hooked. That was one heck of a tank slapper, and that's going to stall the run out. What a save, though, for the number 34 car, but this kind of proves the point. Right now, they're all willing to work together. That white flag drops it is every man for themselves and there's no amount of R&D that can prepare you for that I tell you right now that outside lane is rolling that 39 is all over it Michael Johnson is giving the business right there to Brandon uh, and you see that all it took all it took was two different manufacturers able to work together and you see the back bumper it looks like somebody just went up there and just just Will Smith him to smack the tar out of him on the right hand side of it, but then he dips him. He dips on him and goes to the bottom and sits the 34 to the high side. All that work just to leave your partner. Those are teammates that just about took each other out trying to play hooky on the front row. That 39, as soon as he saw the opening, dove down underneath Bowie. Bowie, of course, has the lead cars basically driving in the mirror at that point, trying to follow what the car behind him does. And when somebody undercuts you like that, your first instinct is to start to follow them. Fortunately for Bowie, he saw what was happening, pulled up before it was too late. But Michael Johnson wants to lead this race pretty bad. You're looking off at the back of him, Brandon 
26 in the 66. The best driver so far here in 2022, a three-time race winner in Fontana, Phoenix, and the Bristol Dirt Race, leading the playoff points coming into tonight. The car pushing him, and you saw to the outside, Liam Sheen's number 92, trying to get back into the conversation. Sheen going to group up with that 34 machine of Bowie as Bowie looks for a bit of redemption. And Brandon Bowie still looking to work the high side. Now, though, the pushy has become the pusher, and he's got Liam Sheen right in front of him in his Nexus Esports Ford Mustang. And a bit of a bad bump in a turn three, just stalls the outside lane. How is that? And all of a sudden, Sheen ducks down to the low side. How about that now, Phillip? Up at the front, pulling out, trying to go for the race lead around Michael Johnson. Vieto will follow soon. Here comes that outside lane once again, mounting the charge on the top side. But it's a question always, how long will it be before that run stalls out? Most of these runs can't keep going forever. And now, Phillip, now almost cleared in this A51 Pro Chevrolet. Will he opt to stay up top, though, or will he be taking Nieto down to the bottom with him? And that's a heck of a push, but I'm noticing something right here with that Toyota. It doesn't look like he's got a lot of speed uh, when he's pushing. It looks like he has a ton of speed being the pusher. But the pushy, it goes nowhere. That outside lane stalls really hard. Like you start to see because people are pulling down. But when you get up on his back bumper, there's not a whole lot of there. And it looks like he has a little bit of damage. Uh, I, I don't know if that's just what the Toyota nose looks like, but it just looks like he's bowed up in the center. But that was an incredible move to the outside. The Chevrolet, uh, a Phillip getting the run to the outside, getting somebody to go push him. And like we talked about, different manufacturers are working together here. The Fords so far have been the stout ones pushing to the front. That Toyota though, he might be the only one that I've seen, but look, it just looks like he's bowed right there. It just looks like he's got just a tad bit of damage on the front end of that 34. It just didn't set right when he's the lead, uh, the lead car there. Here we talk about how damage is going to affect these race cars, right? If you do have a little bit of damage on the front, that's not going to make you the best car to lead a line, right? You're not going to cut through the air as clean. And listen, you're going to have a pusher behind you. You're still going to make plenty of speed, but there is going to be a little bit of a difference that if it was a clean car at the front of the line. Alternatively, if you've got damage on the back end of your race car, you would rather be push, pushing, I should say, rather than being pushed. If somebody's pushing you on a damaged back bumper, it's going to be even more difficult to to keep constant contact with the car that's pushing you and it could get a little bit interesting so things to watch it is a reason to keep your car clean um, a little bit of damage is not going to take you out of the draft the draft uh, is the end all be all that solves all problems if you will uh, but it will have some effects when it comes to the bump draft and um, that's just something to watch as well as these guys take little hits here and there I know we haven't talked a ton about Dane Cruz but his number 46 machine up and now to fifth in line on the inside of the racetrack he's got a little bit left your quarter panel damage from some contact in line earlier and this is a good shot here you're seeing this lead pack goes all the way back to nick silver's number four car silver running in 22nd position the last car in this pack everybody else way off the deep end sean casto in 23rd is some 7.9 seconds back and that's where you'll find the second pack on track no you didn't miss any pit stops just a little bit of that drivers getting out of sync and checkups early created a huge divide and has given this lead pack a massive advantage over the drivers from 23rd on back. I'm still keeping one eye here on Brandon Bowie and Bonazzi Major to see if they can't work their way a little bit further up through the field. And actually, here you can see the lead pack in comparison to the second pack. And this really kind of gives you a bit of a visual cue as to how far the pit road. And that is the challenge, trying to slow a bunch of cars down from 185 miles an hour off of turn number four down to pit road speed when you're three, four wide, trying to slow all those race cars down and not get a speeding penalty at 55 miles an hour. So much like any of uh, the things that we've mentioned tonight where there's risks associated with success it's going to be the same thing you're going to need to find partners to come down pit road with but you can't run each other over so that's really where a team can come in handy right you can go a little bit earlier catch some guys off guard and if you're not on a team if you're radio silent you just got to wait you know if i'm sitting 17th 18th in this pack and i'm a single car team 
I am ready to get onto the brakes every time we come off four, because once I see a group going down, I'm going to want to be with them. You cannot afford to pit on your own here. You really cannot, and you mentioned it perfectly about how difficult it is to slow these cars down without getting a penalty. It's not just the penalties you've got to watch out for. I think we mentioned it before. You also have to always worry about everybody else around you. We actually saw this play a huge role in how last year's Spring Talladega race played on. Now, didn't we? We had a lot of drivers that were all committed in at the exact same time, and we didn't have a single pit stop that was executed cleanly somewhere in every single cycle there was at least two or three cars that got wiped out by people just outbreaking themselves or being caught out by slower braking drivers or breaking a lot more than perhaps they probably needed to it's all these various little factors that make it such a tricky pit road to get onto. Somebody, I remember, I think it was Brandon Gaughan said at one point, this would have been way back in 2015, it is not that hard to get on a pit road here. That might be true if you're by yourself, but it is anything but easy if you're in a big pack. Yeah, you got to watch out for everybody around you. You have to take into consideration that the guy in front of you might not know that you're going so fast, and he might break uh, three quarters of the way uh, to pit road he might lock them up going on to pit lane like we saw yesterday uh, with a couple drivers going around or speeding like brad keselowski did yesterday there's a lot that could happen you're gonna have to fan all the way out to the wall you might miss your mark by just an inch and hit the inside wall you could wreck your teammate coming off a of pit lane like kyle bush did yesterday and now here's the game that we're playing who's going to get to the bottom you have five up top right now everybody else is single file snaking on the low side who comes now because your pit window is open for your three stop race to split this into thirds and I think I see a little a couple people checking down like they're about to go too. If you're on the outside and you want to pit, you got to figure something out, right? Shane Ewing getting pushed by Bradley Burke. They're going to challenge for the race lead here. I don't know if they really care about the bonus point for the lap lead. They just may need to get down in line. You are not going to be able to pit from the outside line of the racetrack. So everybody's slowly going to work their way down. No takers, though. This time through, Ooh. lap number 29 going to go behind. Inside checks up as Miller almost got the left side down onto the yellow line. And that loosened both of them up. Burke just about hooked Ewing who made that side step down for the top position only four cars right now on the outside line of the racetrack everybody else working down on the innermost lane couple of drivers I should note have gone to the garage both Matt Danson and Nick Cohan are out of this race they will get DNF Danson will finish 42nd Cohan will finish 41st Shane Parrish is two laps down in 40th the other 39 cars still running on the lead lap and as we are about a lap away from a one-third distance do we see those green flag pit stops any moment again this time through your top cars don't but here we go a couple of them decide to pull the trigger it is six drivers down and in for service Bowie, Johnson, Chambliss, Six and Rabel all down pit road so first round of pit stops getting underway on the 30th lap of a 94 lap race. It looks to me then like they could very well be trying to execute a two stop strategy. Nobody from the two packs deeper in the field have decided to go down with them. So it looks like it's a pretty cut and dry strategy then. So this is now your leading pack. It is all of a sudden a lot smaller up at the front of this. And you can see there's about five cars right at the tail end that were actually caught out by that sudden run of pit stops. And now they are outside of the draft and struggling, just trying to catch up. And here comes everybody else. A good number of drivers, all except five, coming down in a pit road. Sl three wide, two rows deep down into the lane. And just barely, Minazzi Major gets missed as Kevin King slammed on the binders. Yeah, that was tough right there. You saw a bunch of different uh, things happen there. You saw the 82, he slammed on the brakes, got three wide, got pinched in the middle. As you see the first group that's coming off a of pit lane right here, a, a, a mix of strategy. You see Chevys, you see Fords, you see Toyotas. Uh, the different manufacturers working together now. Some of their teammates are back in the pack in that second one, and you have no other option but to be out here. Shane Ewan stays on the racetrack with about six cars with him here. Uh, they must come down now because you, you don't want to get caught with that big pack. You have to get ahead of them. Do they come down now? Yep, here they come. The last pack coming in. 
So they're going to be down and in for service. Shane Ewing, but three wide as they come on pit road. He got Ewing down, DeBaro, Howe, Cruz, Friedosh, Cato, Kamer, all in for service. Again, that puts a nice bow tie on the rest of the drivers in the lead pack who would have yet to come down to the pit lane. They are down and in this time for service. And now the drivers that we are waiting on, those who are running back in that secondary pack. So through all of this, your net leader and all of this is who we're going to be looking for, and that is Jeremy Miller in that gold number 13 as he races off the corner now. So he is the lead car of those who have pitted with Jaron Winemaster and Kevin King in tow with him. So they were obviously very good on pit road, but it may actually prove that they were too good simply because they're on their own. See that group behind him? You got a group of four, then a group of three or so. If those other cars back there, obviously with more cars, are going to be faster with the draft. They're going to catch these guys. If they go for the pass right away, they may actually leapfrog Miller and company up front. You can see more drivers blending off at the bit lane. You got to borrow and more, pull it up at the back straight away. Uh, that second group of four will swing to the outside to try to get up and around. And now let's see what happens by the time we get to three and four. Liam Sheen being pushed quite aggressively by Bradley Burke here going to be the first duo on the scene they're going about five miles an hour faster than those three cars in front but it looks like Sheen opts not Nolan to go for the fight and will simply tuck in line so mission accomplished so far for Jeremy Miller and mission accomplished for now Jeremy Miller now will be leading uh, one of those big packs on that inside lane and now we're at the point where the double file is just about finished. We're set to go single file for a good chunk now uh, of this race yet to go. So I think now we'll be seeing this, the, the main kind of theme of the race, which will, of course, be these longer single file trains uh, as this race progresses, especially as we get down closer towards the latter stages. It will, won't really be until about 20 laps or so. I'm predicting when we're going to be seeing these packs get double filed back up again because there's no need for it. I mean, why would you bother risking going too wide and nose the tail like this when going single file is arguably even safer, especially in your if you're in a smaller pack like this yeah yeah you got a you got a couple different strategies going on here with uh trudel and all of them staying out so far it's <clears throat> man i don't know i lost the train of thought there got a little stuff in my throat but having two different packs staying out here and you have one that's on the back straight away one going through the trial across in the line what the lead pack right here is hoping for that seven's praying for a caution he's hoping that at some point in time that when that second pack caught the three cars that was out all by themselves on an island alone on gilligan's island they would say that they would have blocked to cause an accident and that didn't happen so now you're going to have the seven which is first all the way back to about but what would have been 15th 16th they're going to have to make a choice you're going to come in you can't take tires because you're gonna go, you're gonna potentially go a lap down, if not more than three quarters of a lap down, and this pack is gonna catch you. But now we have four different packs on this track that's really gonna shake things up because the chances now of a caution, unless somebody just makes a bold move, Evan, it's getting pretty slim here with 36 on the board. It is. At this point, you're starting to figure out where you fall into this race, what you're going to have to do strategy-wise, and a lot of cars on pit road this time from that group that is yet to pit. Harris, Kalist, George, McBride, Johnston, Stanford, Casto, Trudell, Edwards, Kaczynski, all down pit road. You'll see as this pack cycles through the tri-oval, you'll see all those slow cars on the apron on the pit lane exit. Don't even see them because they're still onto the pit lane. So they are way off on pace. Again, no shock here. Those were the cars that were in that secondary pack. Double digit seconds off of the race lead. There they are, bottom of your screen, just now blending out. That leaves us with seven drivers who have yet to come down pit road. And you can tell it on the SK Sim Racing scoring to pile on who they are. Davis, Wetmore, Loria, Schmidt, Mara, Ross, and Morano. And they may all be coming down pit road this time. You can see those intervals turn to yellow pit signs it looks like at least three of them do but schmidt mara ross morano ought to stay out so now the magic number four cars who have yet to come down 
You know, Wetmore, Davis, and LaRia were all running by themselves in a pack of three, so they all decided to come down to the last second. And to be honest, Grant Davis was not expected it, so he had to get on the binders very late to, in order to make sure he came down with them. So you still got Mara Ross Morano as well as Schmidt, who are still running in a pack of their own as well. And they are about a straightaways length ahead of what will become your leading group. I would expect them to be coming on down into pit road before very long. They're the last drivers are waiting on to make their round of pit stops before we are complete for this first run. And then we can start to get ourselves a little bit more set up towards what could be the second set of pit stops, kind of around the 60 to 70 lap range. And in fact, the top four are staying out for one more lap. I find this to be quite interesting here. Typically, you want to come down as early as you can as a pack, at least, to make sure you don't lose as much time. Do you reckon, though, they might be able to make it to halfway, Terry? somebody says they reckon i reckon they might you're gonna have to do something because you're on an island by yourself you're the top four out here you got an 11 and a half second lead you're not gaining you ain't you're losing a ton of time here you got right now you got like i said you still got four packs i mean you got a pack that's all the way back here lane by De, uh dane uh yeah dane cruz he's back here leading on his own uh that's way behind this big pack here and you got the man that is absolutely pulling this train around here. Uh, Miller is, is killing it. They're, they're going so fast, they're separating themselves again like they were when they came off of pit lane. And now here they come. They're down pit lane. Top four goes in. Miller finally takes the lead. But that's an interesting strategy because they ain't going to have a whole lot of help. And I wonder, you know, again, a group of cars who are in that second pack before the pit stops broke off. You mentioned they were 11 seconds ahead. They're going to be a mile behind, maybe literally one or two miles behind because pit road takes about 35 seconds. So they're going to be 20 plus seconds behind the leaders. The only thing I can think of is they got lost in the shuffle early, fell off of the lead pack and said, hey, if we pit right on cycle with everybody, we're still going to be 15 seconds back. Maybe we stay out, push the fuel as much we can. Maybe be hope on a caution flag and then we all of a sudden assume the top positions if everybody else opts to pit but that's the max 40 with 54 laps to go still that takes i think the one stopper out of the equation which you know would have been bold and i think that again they were just kind of hoping for a little bit of luck on their side there but i think very clearly this is a two stop three run race and now that lead pack we talked about how it was a top 22 car group before the pit cycle it is even smaller you are looking at the lead 12 cars all in line single file on the inside line now the top 22 were double digit seconds ahead of the second pack those other cars of that 22 are still close by if you look towards the bottom third of that sk sim racing leaderboard on the left hand side of your screen you'll see dane cruz in 13th position 4.5 seconds off he leads that pack of 13th to 21st that are about four seconds back now that's not at a touch, it's not necessarily close either, uh, but if those guys can maintain, they'll stay in this conversation. If they could gain, it would be even better. I think in order for them to really gain, they would need to have a few more cars working in their little train as well. But in order for them to get more cars into their train, they would have to back off by a good, we're talking eight to 10 seconds or so. And at that point, even with the extra four cars they bring onto their group, it wouldn't be nearly enough to bring them right back up to the leaders not by the time the second run of pit stops hit so it just would not be worth it maybe if they could pick up some of the lap traffic that has started to be caught by the leaders i know there's a group of two chris edwards and mike kuczynski who are both being caught extreme uh, performance motorsports teammates that are about to be caught by the leaders in about a lap or two here maybe if they end up losing the touch of the lead pack they can tag on to that second train and maybe help them to push their way back up to the leaders that is realistically i would think the only way though that that second train is going to get into the conversation properly if they want to be able to go and battle for a race win tonight yeah, and this, this part of the race right here, this little lull spot, you, you always get it here at these plate tracks, especially if you get a green flag pit stop, because you are going to break it into different packs. Uh, but you see the, the back of the pack, they're going to get antsy here in a little bit. You know, you're, you want to position yourself to be up front and lead the train going on pit lane. You don't want to leave your fate in somebody else's hands. Hey, the 31 comes down pit lane right here uh, on the next green flag pit stops, and he has to lock him up because he couldn't get down. He loses the rear end. 
Everybody else behind him has to, has to fan out. They have to just scatter like cockroaches. They don't want to have to do that. So I say about lap 50, lap 55, you're going to see somebody have to go up there and make a run. You see them separating just a tad bit to see how much of a draft they could pull up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that's going to happen here before the next green flag pit stop that's going to show us who's really got the raw speed in their car to walk out of here in, in sweet home Alabama. And all I'm saying is the lead group of 12 the last time by was slower than the group of nine chasing them. That group 13th to 21st has been about two tenths of a second better per lap. Again, it's it's not going to happen in the blink of an eye, but Dane Cruz, his interval now, 3.9 seconds on that SK Sim Racing leaderboard, still running in 13th position. So over the course of this run, they may be able to close that either all the way down or get it to within a second or a half a second to the point where when you get to the next cycle of the green flag pit stops you can make the move right you see lead pack top of your screen your second pack on the bottom they need to get there by the pit stops that is the key for that group and again even though the lead pack has more cars and the lead pack doesn't look overly uncoordinated nolan right i mean terry mentioned you saw some of the drivers gap at each other dropping it back trying to pull up so it's not like the guys up front are perfect but they're certainly not sloppy i think it's very impressive about what we're seeing out of those back nine yeah absolutely i mean it only takes about those nine or so cars to be able to put on a pretty good show and they haven't put it on a solid show on trying to be able to push their way back up to the front as well and you mentioned of course they are starting to close on in and that is exactly what they need to do we went from was about 4.3 seconds down to 3.6 that is quite a substantial amount of gain if they could get within about two and a half seconds that gap would just crumble away until they are right back with the leaders that is about all it would take for them to have to really push their ticket uh, into being able to once again get into the conversation we are about to have our main pack fully formed which hasn't happened so far terry ever since dancing got into the wall back on i believe it was about, about the eighth lap of the race well, that back nine's looking like Tiger Woods when he won the Masters. See, Evan, I am a little bit knowledge when it comes to some other stuff other than cars going fast. But that, that back, look at him. Look at that 46. He gets the shot from Michael Johnson. He's going to get it right here coming out of the corner. He'll get a square shot here. There he goes. You see him trail breaking just a tad bit. You can see that TRD Toyota, man. He just pulls back. Don't want to push through the trioval. And as soon as they come off this, so before they get to the corner, he'll give him one more shot. Even with a little bit of damage crinkling in that driver uh, side, it ain't hurting him a whole lot. He'll get the run through the center of the corner, keep it tucked right there, right there in the center, and he knows he can just give him one more pop right here, all the way down the back. Straight away, he goes locked to the bumper. That's the recipe right there. They're coming with a head of steam, and Evan, if they don't have a caution before they catch him, that's your caution. Yeah, they are working hard, and that onboard perfectly illustrates it. Because again, watch in the corner, he backs off him. Because again, you don't want to be on the bumper going up the banking, but he's going to try to time it. So when they come down the hill here, he wants to give him another shot before they get to the trioval. He was able to get that extra shot in last lap. Couldn't do it this lap. Again, it's a hard dance that these drivers got to work, but he's going to go to give him one more shot before they get into the corner. Is he going to get off the bumper? And watch this. He's going to get to the bumper close enough. You hear a little bit of a lift because you can see those Toyota letters. He doesn't want to hit him in. But then watch this. See the black line. Watch that get closer, 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 closer. Now Toyota's gone. The second he gets off the corner, he's there. You want to get on the bumper the second they straighten out. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. And this will help their cause because your race leaders are racing. The 95 of Bradley Burke to the outside, pushed by Agno Phillips. Sam Nieto's there. So now you're really going to see those intervals close in yeah i was about to mention that as well you had a good chunk of the drivers in that leading pack that were starting to break apart and i think this was exactly what ford they were trying to get a run up and they got a run indeed bradley burke being shoved by philip and Nieto in the mad dash to turn number one the top three now going to be sticking together on the outside lane they have that little alliance that is oh so precious at a track like this and kevin king from behind he wants in so does half of the leading pack 
back. They're all now scrambling to the outside line. And just like that, you've got yourself a huge drafting help from that leading pack that the second train doesn't have anymore because, well, the cars that were being uh, helping them to draft on up, they've all had a push jump to go and battle for the race lead. Man, it's like I called it. I said before lap 50, somebody's going to be in the chat and think that I got some magical ball or we recorded this race beforehand, but this is live, man. I just had a hunch that before lap 50, we were going to get racy up here in this lead pack. There's no way you could tell one of these drivers, hey, I want you to sit in line. We're going to ride here, single file here at Talladega. Yeah, you come here to race. You put you sit in that thing sim rig and you tightened your hands on that wheel. You're here to feel the speed. You're here to race. It's like in the official when you get out there and you're racing with your buddies and they're like, man, let's just ride the line. Heck no. Go to the outside. Let's beat and bang, side draft. Forget safety rating. Forget I rating. It's Dago week. And more cars going to get lapped up top. You can add James Ross and Tom Morano to the list of drivers to lap it down. Uh, they'll be fighting for the lucky dog along with Chris Edwards and Mike Kaczynski, and they should try to tuck in line here to stay in the draft and better their odds at that as this race closes down. The gap for the secondary pack uh, still at about three seconds and change because uh, they in their own right got a little bit shuffled up. Uh, they lost a lot of time the last lap. Dane Cruz put down a 50 Point four three seven. You compare that to the forty nine nine five six from Burke. So just as your leaders start mixing it up, and that secondary pack has their best opportunity to gain, they make a mistake in their own right. Got a little bit of shuffle that aligned, lost significant time there, and they're actually now falling back in the red. They're losing that momentum, guys. For all those laps, they did well. All it took was one bad one. Look at the intervals now: four point one, four point zero. Oh, they lost about a second and change just from one bad lap and that'll help these race leaders out a little bit but I think once we went racing side by side here I don't think we're going back to single file that time by the lap was led by was it the 86 machine of Dominic how it was he gets his first bonus point of the night now the 27 to borrow pushed by Jiren Winemaster will dive down to the inside and now they are in control of this field so all 12 cars scrapping for it past halfway here here in Dega. And look out now for Shane Ewing up on the top shelf being shoved by Jeremy Miller into turn number three, trying to push him back towards the front of the field. And he has bump trapped with him all the way through the corner. That is a very risky move. We've seen this play out badly, not just in the sim, but in the real world as well. DeBarro goes up to cover the run. It's a big shot to the back end of the DeBarro sliders. Toyota Camry, who is going to hold on to the race lead. That's some good defense there from Anthony DeBarro, trying to make sure he can cover off both lanes at once. But that is a very, very risky battle to play, and you're not going to be able to play it for very long. Well, Nolan, you can smell it like the rock at WrestleMania. This race turned up, and it turned up great. You started to see it started to get tired, and I, mean, I almost had to go take a shot of Rowdy Energy just to wake up because I was thinking they were just going to go single file all race long. But what a block right there. That was great momentum called up there by Ewing, and then you just see him slide up there, cut that run off. But look, second pack. 2.9 seconds. They're starting to gain again. You've seen side drafting start to happen. Everybody wants to lead this race. And now the 13 goes to the bottom. We're side drafting some more. We're going to side draft fourth on back. Now it's going to close to being three wide here. Now it is. He's not happy with two wide. He wants more. That's the 14 car coming up the middle there. And to be, oh, and it's all going to go wrong. The 72 gets oh. turned. There it is in turn number two after 54 laps. The first caution of the afternoon flies. And after all of that aggressive racing we saw amongst your race leaders, Finally, they took it a little bit too far, and the driver who got hooked around first was Chris Edwards. Looked like it was off of the bumper of James Ross, who was that white and red 14 who put us three wide. There was actually a secondary that at the back. Kyle Kamer got caught out by the second pack, checking up for this wreck, and actually spawned himself 
into the outside wall and fully around right behind all of this mess. And that was, a, shall we say, not a very pretty incident that we found ourselves now under caution for the first time. But I have to say, I find a, I, I don't really find any way to find James Ross at fault. He may have been the one to put us three wide, yes, but there was absolutely a hole there. And he had made the most of it, stuck his nose in there. He was alongside for a good little while. And Chris Edwards, well, shall we to say he had a bit of a lane up to his outside would be a little bit generous. Try a lane and a half, almost half a track. Watch this. I mean, Edwards just keeps coming down, keeps coming down. Nowhere for Ross to go, and it's right there. There's the continent. They get hooked together, and Nieto gets into it. Kevin King just avoided that. I think Rainbow scraped on the outside lane, and there you can see right at the back, Kyle Kamer going around as well by his own doing. How was that? That took a long time to wreck right there. Normally you see these Talladega wrecks, it's bam, 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 done. That one took about a half a lap to finally get it, but you could you could feel it. You could start to get goosebumps that these boys were getting racier and racier each lap that we went. We had more dicier moves. Everybody wanted to block. It was time to side draft. You see a smoker right there in the corner, but hey, we're back together. And we got a big old field of people coming down pit lane right here. This is interesting because the drivers who went the longest on fuel to that first green flag cycle of pit stops went 40 laps. This time by 39 laps to go. So expect everybody to fill it up and try to go to the end of the race. Of course, I think the bigger question is going to be, can we possibly go 40 laps to the end of the race without an incident? Shane Ewing down to the pit lane goes gas only on the 32 Toyota, but he will not win the race off of pit road. It is one off by Anthony DeBarro in the 27. The second car in leapfrogs the Rayvac Fusion Toyota, and it'll be be DeBaro leading the race, fuel only at the front of the field. Tell you what, this caution really was a blessing in disguise for that second group. You talked about how much time they had lost in just about two laps, a full second just about when they've been working for the last 15 just to gain up all of that time. Well, now they can finally stop the bleed and then they're going to be right up there now and battling it out once again with the race leaders. We don't really have to do a whole lot of work to catch the main pack, but the main pack will give you a little bit of a helping hand for you. So now we're going to be seeing a very big front pack again, which is what we like to see when it comes to Talladega racing. But now that we're in the second half of this race, I have to kind of put the question out there to you, gentlemen. Do we think it'll be this, a similar situation as what we saw in the first half of this race where it was relatively tame and people are still willing to work together? Oh, if that's first thrown to me, heck no. There's no more calm. Uh, they they pull the Miley Cyrus out. Can't be tamed. You ain't going to tame these beasts. It's time to go. We're going to throw lap 58 on the board when we take this green flag. All you see right now is checkers. You don't care about the caution. You don't care about only. Well, you care about the meatball. You don't get the meatball flag, but checkers. That's all you see. Uh, you got a long way to go in the season, man. Tear them up. And admittedly, there's a long way to go in this race, right? 38 laps this time by. Snow walk in the park. It's a good healthy margin to race in here at Talladega. Under green, that's a good 45 minutes or so. But does anybody care? I don't think so. I think this race is, is done. <laughs> you know, I don't think we're going to see the, you know, the, the, the group splitting apart. I don't think we're going to see, you know, obviously no more pit stops because everybody should be able to go to the end of this race on a fuel from this point. But I think that's it. We have lost our clean Talladega race, and it is now time for the crapshoot. And listen, we might have 20 lap green flag runs, 25, but I would be very surprised if this is the final yellow of the night, which is interesting as the lights go out on top of the pace car for a couple of reasons. One, if we go green to the end of the race, these drivers all should be good on fuel. Again, we've seen drivers go 40. They're going to have to do 37 by the time we come around. Might need a little bit of saving. You probably can't lead all 30. 37 of those laps, but you should be good to the end. The question thereafter comes, if we have yellows, the way the fuel is on these cars now, you probably don't have enough for overtime. So if we get yellows, do you either come down and top them off to try to get fuel to, to you know, be a little bit more safe into an overtime window? Or do you try to use those yellows to save fuel to get a little bit later? I think that's the question to mark. The easiest thing is if it goes green, but admittedly, I don't have a ton of faith in that playing out that way. 
I kind of have to agree with you on that one. So could be an exciting restart. Will it be the last restart of the day? I, I don't think so. I think we're going to be getting at least one more before tonight is done. If anything, from what we've been seeing in races prior should be to go by. So now I think the biggest question is how long will it be before we get to that next yellow? Will it be almost immediately as drivers try to struggle to get up to speed? Or will it come a little bit later in the run when the aggression starts to kick off within those last 10 laps? I'm not going to lie. I, I think they're going to be making it a bit deeper than a few laps of this one. Yes, it's not uncommon to see drivers acting a little bit more aggressive than normal on race starts. I mean, the initial start it was really hectic. You saw quite a bit of three wide action in there. But it is, of course, also worth noting that they did get themselves calmed down relatively quickly. And we're not close enough to the end of the race where making a bonsai three wide charge on the outside lane would be worth it. Let's go time. I, I, I see checker flag. I don't, I don't see nothing else. I, I, then again, this is why in any leagues, cause I get tossed out of them because I'm aggressive. But front row, man, you got to go. And 27 took the outside lane here. That was a pretty interesting move. Hey, first time tonight off of a restart. Control car can choose the lane, so Tabaro goes to the outside. So, based on our conversation, coming to 37 laps to go and the checkered flag. A pace car is off it in. Tabaro takes the green flag at the outside. It's a good jump and a hill lead in the run to turn one. A solid lead there, but he's got no help on the outside lane, and he realized this going to chop right back down in front of Shane Ewing, and Dominic Howe might be hanging on for now, but it won't be hanging on for very long. There's not a single driver willing to help him out unless Shane Ewing goes up to give him a bit of a helping hand. He does not, so Dominic Howe now starting to fall back, and he'll have to wait for Brian Chambliss and Brandon Six to catch up as they thunder down the back straightaway. Oh, man, and everybody fans out there in the 25's got a big old run here. I'm not too sure if uh, that almost was a wreck right there. I thought the 25 was going to jump to the third line and get the run around it, but it didn't happen. He stayed there, and now you see the 27, who was able to throw a very good block with the 32 on his back bumper. 27's been able to work all three lanes without losing any speed whatsoever and keep the car under control. He's figured something out about this next-gen car, and that 20 Toyota looks good. Two Toyotas lead it here with a, a, a monster full of four Chevrolets, two Fords rounding out here in your top eight. And again, no surprise, the inside the party place to be. Bradley Burke, though, going to go to the outside. So that is one of those Chevrolets going up top, going to hook up with Agno Phillip. Agno, who has been one of the best single car speed uh, drivers all year long, but has not got the results that he's been looking for. Agno wants to fight for a title here in 2022. He had a good shot at it last season, ready to take that next step. It'll be a perennial competitor. Hasn't had a ton of luck. Haven't uh, really talked a ton about him either, despite leading eight laps. Oh, and there goes to borrow the race leaders into the outside wall. Rabel gets set there as well. They'll wreck through the grass. And what just happened to the 27 of Anthony DeBarro, who wrecks out from the race lead? Oh, my. I'm speechless, just absolutely speechless there. And I think it was a bad push by Shane Ewing. And in fact, it was hooked him in the left rear. And then Anthony is oh. over corrected head first into the outside wall. He collected Brian Chambliss. Luckily, the pack overall didn't really get into that. So you have the borrow that was involved. Then you have Thomas George. I think Grant Davis got a piece of that as well. I know San Diego got clipped at the last second by San Diego. A good number of drivers went screaming through the infield grass to go evasive and get around this wreck but that could easily have been a 20 plus car pile up and thank goodness that it wasn't not gonna lie when i saw the car hit the wall i thought of the spongebob episode when the health inspector came in with the nasty patty because all you see is that burger just collide with the wall and i was like oh man but that was a tough hit I mean, he flew over a car, and then it kind of, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of went through the mind here. Some of them I can't say, but the scene of Talladega Nights when Ricky Bobby goes flipping upside down, it's like, yep, I'm flying through the air. This ain't good. He had, a, he had a Ryan Newman moment. He was right over the top of another car. That could have been big. Luckily, it wasn't. But, Evan, you had a question. Pit or not to pit for green-white checkers, there's a couple in the back and the rest are clutching here. 
Yeah, you know you're going to want to, at minimum, save that fuel. I mean, listen, if we only went, uh, what, two, three laps there before another yellow, I think we're going to have enough cautions to save fuel over the run. But, yeah, some of the guys at the back, damage repair, and also, why not, come in and top off. Here's the perspective of Kyle Trudell. Oh, oh, look oh, out, oh. wrecking high, wrecking low, and he survives. I know you mentioned Ryan Newman. Uh, that was Brian Chambliss in this uh, regard. Ryan Newman seemed to always have cars landed on top of him in plate races over the years, and that was Chambliss, who had um, the race leader to borrow come crashing down on him and sent the 25 into the outside wall. Those were the two major hits in all of this. Uh, the driver who I mentioned wrecking low was George. Uh, Thomas George got tagged and spun out trying to avoid it. And Look at that. Watch this again. Kyle Trudell. Oh. Smoke. The 24 starts spinning. Right here, you can't really see where he's going, right? You're just holding left, holding left, and I think he's going to catch it on a good rotation. The front just wow. spins out of the way. There's the six car of George. Going to start to wreck underneath and parting the seas. It's Trudell there up the middle. Somebody better get that man a staff because he's parting the Red Sea tonight. And that's, that's luck. I would rather be lucky than good at Talladega. Uh, I, I wish I had some luck on my side, but cow, that was awesome. I think one of the biggest uh, moments there was the fact that there was nobody underneath him to wreck because he was on the outside lane. That would have been oh so easy for him to just drift down on instinct just to get around that wreck. And that is a mistake that I think all of us have seen so many times previously. Obviously, if you're on the outside lane and you hear car low, you're mo more likely than not never going to be turning down low. But as soon as the smoke starts to fly, you're not listening to a spot. It. You're just going with where you feel you need to go the most, especially if you don't have a proper in-sim spotter like Andrew Freenosh does. This is on board with Grant Davis, who was not so unfortunate. Oh, oh I actually think he was. Did he actually get around that? I think he actually might have just escaped that one. I heard a hit, but... I think the the right side of the car is is still there at least. This is that had to be. I'm telling you, we we saw the slowest wreck in Talladega history, and we just saw the fastest wreck that could have taken out this field. We could have seen this entire field jumbled up if if he just would have stayed a little bit lower and not kept it to gas. Look at this. Woo! Wreck there in the door. We got him in the door. Man, that's exciting. I love Daytona. I love Talladega. He hit the car spinning. He bounced down into the six, which sent him spinning. Um, so he definitely took a couple of licks. But I'll tell you what, for uh, for a hit at that speed, I think the uh, Hasib design uh, machine is still in a uh, in a good position, um, all things considered. So um, one other note, uh, Shane Ewing, of course, was at the center of that contact because the 32 machine uh, was the driver who was pushing Anthony DeBarro at the time. He has claimed responsibility for the incident, so he will receive an end of the longest line of penalty and his Dizzy Motorsports Toyota Camry get to go to the rear. Um, we haven't really touched on it tonight, Nolan, but I do want to mention pretty quick, having just ran the Bristol Dirt Race and then just just the week before that, a road course race in Coda, where track limits were strictly enforced, there are a lot of drivers sitting on penalty points, including Connor Horn, who is not competing here this afternoon because he got more than six penalty points and was suspended for one race. So uh, we talk about penalty points, claiming cautions, not claiming them. Maybe Shane wanted to play it safe there because there's quite a few drivers in penalty point trouble. That's not even to mention the four drivers who are currently sitting on probation. You mentioned, of course, track limits from Circuit of the Americas, and that's where a good number of our uh, in penalty points came from uh, l a couple of weeks ago when we were racing there with a lot of off-track 1Xs. But it kind of brings another question that is very specific to super speed races like this. And I'll let you answer this one, Evan, because obviously you're a bit more of a rule book guru on this than I am. Does RSR have a yellow line rule? There is a yellow line rule. So while iRacing will not uh, have a, an enforceable yellow line rule, you cannot pass below the yellow line on the inside unless you are forced. Drivers tend to be pretty good at it. 
Haven't seen it tonight. Bet you if we got a couple of drivers in the mix, though, going for the race win a little bit later, that may be a topic of conversation. So the base car is going to go back behind us. Let's try this one again with 32 laps to go. Bradley Burke takes the green flag, and we're back underway. Burke pulls clear. Agnell Villa tucks down in the line to the mad dash of the turn number one. Jeremy Villa, the machine, still side by side as we cycle our way back through turns one and two. Jerry Wymaster trying to make some ground on the inside lane as well. Liam Sheen pulls up and out of line, forcing How to Lift to avoid hooking the 92 guard down the inside lane. And now Sheen's gonna abandon the outside lane and tuck down low. Does not want to take the chance of being on the top side right now. Chevrolet's looking real good right now. One, two, three, four with Liam Sheen in the Ford being the only one in the top five, but he's got a Ford behind him. So you have two opportunities here to pull out because you have a Toyota leading the line here. Top lane or bottom lane gets squirrely. 13 of Jeremy Miller was all over the back bumper of Phillip. This is where we get dicey because we just saw a big wreck and I don't think they care. They're out here to race. It's, it's full go mode here with thir almost 30 to go. Yeah, they seem pretty unfazed. That 13 Richard Miller going to lead the outside. He's pushed by Liam Sheen, Dominic Howe up there as well. Uh, pretty even inside to outside here. And look at him go down the back straightaway. A bit of a wiggle. That 13 just got a whale of a shot. He's clear to the inside. They're both clear. Oh. And for the undercut goes Sheen. Crosses him over underneath. He'll go to the race lead. But for how long, though? No drafting support down low. And it looks like Miller will get the last lap because he leads the field off of turn four. And a huge jackup as well. Liam Sheen just lost all speed on the exit of turn number uh, four. Oh, and it's another huge stack. It was Jeremy Miller now gets out of line. What on earth is going on? Sees when drivers go down to the low side. They just lose all sorts of speed. Jeremy Miller lost 10 miles an hour and nearly wrecked the entire inside lane as a result. Yeah, it looks like they're starting to catch that apron there. They're getting so much of a draft here that when we get down in the corner, they, they're having to put a little bit extra wheel into it to keep this thing up. Here goes the 13 of Miller back to the outside. There's just so much going on that it's hard to keep track of. You got two by two all the way through, second on back. And there's, there's cars pulling out a lot all over the place. Who's going to pull out for three as Miller goes, tries to go to the lead here? Hey, that was a lot to happen at once and I think it goes to show you the second you get off of someone's bumper it's like a parachute on the back of the race car you lose all your momentum the second you get back on someone's bumper I mean you get five six miles an hour in the draft really quick I mean when you saw Sheen get pushed into the car in front of him on the low line he was yelling over the radio check 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 letting him know I got a lift because I'm going to run through the 13 Miller thought he got played for the race lead in three ended up winning out in four and by the time he got to the start finish line he was fifth or sixth in line there's another move by him to go from the high lane to the low lane now in front of Dominic Howe he'll lead down on the inside line Miller having led 10 laps tonight that's the second most second only to Liam Sheen who has led 15 laps tonight overall we have seen um, as many as about 10 or so different drivers to have led laps this afternoon and maybe the inside starting to get it advantage but I'm with you guys I don't think this thing's going to settle down anytime soon it's going to be 28 more laps of bare knuckle all out brawling here at Talladega and this lead pack that's about 27 cars deep usually the in sim radio amongst the drivers as a whole is relatively calm and quiet except for some points under caution when drivers have a thing or two to say usually not very kind things so to speak about the incident that just took place right now though it is an absolute hot box of chatter at the moment down there everybody is trying to communicate with everybody else just at the same time just to see if the teams can't communicate something with each other some people are saying push grant push grant trying to see if they can't organize a charge elsewhere in the field and that's of course just amongst the drivers as a whole that is not counting all of the individual team chatters that are likely going on elsewhere you've also got Freenos trying to communicate uh, with his spotter slash crew chief as well Paul Bliss while all of this is going on you've got so much happening all at once and it really goes to show that while it might look nice and simple on the track this is about one of the busiest racetracks you can possibly encounter
Absolutely, Nolan. And I want to take a look right here at what the, look at the 92. Look at the front bumper as we're going to come through the trial right here. They're going to come across here and there's some bumps there. You're going to see the front end start to bounce up and down. That's where you're losing some speed. Look at them. They're going to come through here. They're going to catch the bumps, start to wiggle. Everything starts to move. It's going to continuously go through here. And those blocks aren't going to go so well, especially if you do it there in the trial bowl. One bump, Evan, through the center of that over one of those bumps and you're going to pit lane. And that is a black flag because then you are speeding on to pit road and your finishing position if it is the last lap does not count he's got a little bit of bounce in that front thing looks like a basketball but hey three wide right there there goes the spotify machine that uh that 82 is looking sporty I don't know if it's quite porpoising, but that's the uh, that's the word that everybody's using these days. So maybe it's a bit of porpoising as they go through the bumps there on the inside of that trioval. And again, it goes back to the onboard look we looked at earlier in this race, right? As we watch Burke do everything he can to get around Sheen. You want to push here, but you don't want to push here. And that's where, right Whoa. there, see, there you go. You did it. And he ends up three wide. You don't want to push in the trioval for that reason exactly. When that car in front of you is bound up and down and wiggling side to side you are begging to hook either the car in front of you or for you to hook yourself around and getting a little bit overzealous there was Bradley Burke and he's going to pay for it he was seventh at the start finish line last time by and he is dropping way down now to 23rd just like that of course it's better than to be in the wall it was a nice save but that goes to show you don't mess with that tri -oval. this racetrack only clocks in as a four turn super speedway but it might as well be five with how tight and how highly banked that tri -oval is as liam sheen gonna two step down to the inside go for the race lead and it'll send the donnie former should have agno philip down the sucker hole in the middle and nobody's willing to work with Philip. Nobody wants to risk checking out the outside lane. So half that outside line is now moved to the top side, making it now three wide, multiple rows deep. It is now going to be Brandon Six to lead the outside group all the way back to David Kolb has cleared Agno Philip, who went from running second to not even being inside the top 10 or even theoretically close to the top 10 when it comes to the timing charts. He's still gotten three wide, deeper in the field. This is where it all starts to fall apart. This is where alliances start to disintegrate. And now you get two different types of team mentalities when it gets down to the end of the race, right? You get the one type of team who will stick with each other right down to the bitter end, even finishing one, two, three, four, single file if they have to, just to guarantee, oh, trouble! Middle of the pack, Trudeau gets turned, Nick Silver goes down as well. It's a pile up on the inside lane, two cars collected, not three though. So no caution, we stay green. And that broke part of the pack up, but luckily for us, they still have some draft here, but you see them start to single file out again. Not for long. I, I spoke too soon. There goes the 34 to the outside. He's going to try to get the run. This is when the side draft really starts to come into a play. We're coming down to uh, roughly 20 to go. Everybody's got to get a position here. This is your opportunity because if we do get, if we take a look at the replay here, You'll see what happened is the Ford just got hooked right there. That's uh, that's a tough break for him because two cars not on the racing surface. No caution is called. So you have a piece of a lap traffic there in the third group. Who's going to check up and go in front of the second lane to attempt to make the run? Oh, and also you got the third pack that's right there that's going to get the run as well. This race isn't over. It's just getting good. I mean, these guys do not care. Look at Brandon Six. He kind of splits the difference to go to the outside, but King pulls up, then pulls back down. Now the 29 are able up. He pulls back down. Nobody really knows what lane they want to be in right now, and I can't blame you because there's really no lane that's going to win you the race. We are still 21 laps away from giving out the checkered flag and points in this Talladega 250. It seems like everybody's really going with wherever the hot hand is, wherever the momentum is, whoever's got the run, that's who they want to dance with. And the problem is that momentum changes 
every 10 to 15 seconds. So you're just begging for somebody to get out of line, to get a little bit uncoordinated, and to hook each other around. The field is very fortunate that that two-car incident, again, was off the racing surface and wasn't three or more because, therefore, no caution was given. And this race carries on. Of course, it's a tough blow for the drivers who were in that incident. The likes of Trudell and a company now losing significant time. But if they don't uh, settle it down, we're going to be behind the pace car before you know it because you just can't sustain this for 30 plus laps and you see that third lane four cars up there kevin king trying to go up let's go four wide why not agno philip gonna make a fourth lane this will be tight by the time we get to turn one yeah that inside lane really tightens up right when they get out of the front straight away door to door contact between the likes of michael johnson and now philip but they somehow managed to survive it philip is still stuck on the outside lane but at least he's only three not four i tell you what you think three wide is tight you're gonna wish you had as much room that three wide offered you would get for a breast like that but philip did a great job to manage that held his line about as good as he could and now trying to help Kevin King push his way back up through the field with Brandon Six and Michael Lariah in tow all on the top shelf. But once again, heads up, lap traffic going to be getting in the way. Look out for Kyle Kamer and Chris Edwards, who are both lap traffic and off pace. The guys at the back are going to start to tuck it in. We're going to go four wide again, but this time it won't last nearly as long. Yeah, unfortunately, they don't have a whole lot of run out there on that outside. The, the bottom lane's really preferred at the moment. You see a couple people getting up there trying to get a little bit on the back bumper to shove harder across here, but you're going the long way around the racetrack. You're going to have to settle in. Go mano y mano with those drivers. If you can get 12 cars in the line on the middle lane, then you have an opportunity to get them. But right here, racing two, three wide, back here in the back, you're losing a ton of speed. You're losing a ton of time. You see a three-car breakaway right there. But also to point, we talk about four wide being uh, being tight here. I remember when this place used to go five wide, when the cars were just a little bit more shrunk in there on the nose. These next-gen cars, about a half inch bigger or a little wider than what they were a couple years prior. That could affect the racing coming across the line. We can see somebody maybe think that they could fit the nose in there, but in all actuality, they can't. Anthony DeBarro has gone to the garage. He joins the likes of Parrish, Cohen, and Danson, who will not make it to the end of this Talladega. 250 now inside of 20 laps to go in Lincoln, Alabama. Almost everybody condensed down to two lanes. A couple of drivers towards the rear just now tucking in line. And maybe a small moment for these drivers to take a deep breath, reset, and get ready to do it all again. The inside's got an advantage of about six cars. The 11 and David Cobb the lead driver on the outside running in seventh at the moment. A couple of drivers we haven't talked a ton about, though. Andrew Frenosh in the conversation for the first time tonight after he started back in 28th. Cobb has been up here all night, but he is the biggest mover at plus 26 positions. You're looking at your lead pack, 22 cars strong, willing to fight for the race win and looking to lock themselves into the postseason. Miller to the outside. No takers, though. They are all going to go to the outside to leave him and he is going to lose a ton of spots down the chute. And Jeremy Miller top back in line and checked up Dane Cruz. That stacked out the entire inside lane. You saw drivers once again scrambling left and right. Some even straddling the yellow line even more in favor of the apron. Very risky business there. You cannot advance a position below that line but it looks like everybody just managed to escape that one. So under 20 laps to go and continuing to cycle our way through the closing stages of this race and every single lap, these drivers get a little bit more aggressive because they realize there's about 50 seconds less time for them to try to make these moves and get themselves up at the front of this race. Time is really starting to tick away. It is now crunch time. You cannot afford to be nice anymore. Nolan, you threw it in my head when you talk about risky business. Cause that, I'm telling you, the moves that the 34 and the 13 is going kind of looks like Tom Cruise sliding there to some Bob Seeger. You got three wide back here in the back as they come across there, heading down. Came down the, the Alabama game back straight away to the front here. They're still pushing. You see a little bit of a snake there trying to get a little bit of no, or air on the front nose of these cars to get a little bit more of a draft. 
He can't make a whole lot of moves as now we got two going to the outside. And, well, that would happen to be the 13 and he thinks twice of it. He's going to jump back down to the bottom all the way up to the wall. Uh, they're going everywhere. They're trying to find some room here. If it was up to them, they'd make this racetrack wider than it was. I mean, they're doing everything they can to find some space. Castu up there, another name we haven't talked a ton about to this point of the afternoon, leading the outside line in ninth position. He is plus 23, a lot of drivers, some 20 some odd positions into the green that are fighting up here for the race win late at the Talladega Super Speedway. Round number seven of this 2022 full throttle real sim racing cup series. We're happy that you're with us on Race Spot TV as David Cobb is controlling the inside line, trying to hold on for the race win. Winemaster High, Casto crosses underneath. Is there room under the 48, though? No, he hesitates. He'll drop back down to the inside line. And we go back to two wide now as the 34 car of Bowie, the one who drops backwards in the sucker hole this time. We didn't see a whole lot of sucker hole action throughout the entirety of the first half. And there, tell you what, this field is making up for that in force here in these last 15, 20 laps or so as they have been struggling to make up ground. And you can tell that that outside line really is a crunch down because anytime somebody jumps up from the inside lane, they all immediately jump up to open up that third line. They do not want to get held up for anything. And look at the charge from Jaron Wymaster by Jeremy Miller alongside with Cobb. And I think Wymaster doesn't lead the lap of the line. Missed out by just two thou. So Jaron Wymaster still struggling to try to close his way up and make sure that he can hang on to that outside line, but it is not going to be easy, especially if Jim Miller decides he wants to abandon and go down low first. Man, he is all over that back bumper, and they are pushing the pusher. <laughs> they don't care. They're pushing anything in sight. I think, I don't know. I don't know what's going to be more spectacular. Is that outside lane getting a run, or this bottom, this middle lane pushing up here to get this lead? Jeremy Miller was all over the back bumper of Winemaster, and he was moving him up and down the track. I watched him touch every dotted line through the center of the corner, and Miller gave no bones about it man he was really giving him the business through here uh, it, it, oh man oh this is this is too good evan this is too good we talk about what's on the line yes we're getting into the middle portion of the season we started tonight's show talking about how this is kind of the dog days five weeks in a row middle of the regular season if you've been struggling now's the time to turn up the wick and because of the domination of drivers like brandon six we've only seen four different race winners so there's plenty of ways to point your way into those 16 drivers who will fight for the championship of course the end all be all Take home a checkered flag. If your name is not six horn dance at a rapper heart, you want a race win here to know that you'll fight for the full throttle cup this season. Kevin King now goes to the race lead. That was courtesy of a push from the 94 of Agno Phillips. So they tuck down, control the inside. Kevin oh, King boy. sees the run coming though, tries to block Sheen. Sheen goes high, but Burke stays. And because the 95 didn't go with him, Sheen's on his so oh, look no! out, Burke gets turned. He's off and down onto the apron. Caution flies oh, at lap number 84. What a hit for the 51 and the 95 there. Oh man, that, uh, that shook it all up because now we thought chaos was really a thing with 30 to go. We gotta have under 10 to go, but you see right here on this replay, He's got the 95 air moving back and forth, like slipping on some ice. Bam! Thought he was in there, but he wasn't in there like swimwear. He was, uh, he didn't, he didn't fit too good. Didn't fit like my bathing suit either. Tough break. We saw how many times they got away with that. Probably a dozen. And this time it just did not pan out. It starts again there. The push. He slows himself down though. And then he's going to get tagged from behind. How looked somewhat non-committal. Nolan, did he want to go four wide? Was he simply just lifting? And I mean, you weren't going to fit four wide because at 92, a sheen wasn't expected. And so you were trying to fit about four lanes worth of race cars into about two and a half. And that's the only possible outcome when that happens. I think the big problem started to come when Brad Burke got a little bit squirrely. He was trying to keep it in line 
with Kevin King and gave him a bit of a bad nudge. That obviously did not help because that stacked up the line. Bradley Burke slowed up and Dominic Howe, I don't think could slow up in time, so he immediately tried to scramble low because he was either that or run over Bradley Burke, and unfortunately there just wasn't any kind of room for him because the problem with Dominic Howe, I don't think he wanted to go for wide, but I mean, what's he going to do? If he slows up, by even just two miles an hour, he's going to get run over by Minazzi Major, who is right behind him. He was already going slower than Major. He could see that coming a mile off. That was realistically the only option he had, unless he were to just hit square with Bradley Burke. I tell you what, though, all things considered, Dominic Howe had a pretty impressive save uh, in the midst of all of that, but still could have been a lot worse, but I imagine for him it could have been a lot better as well. And Andrew Friedosh got a face full of that whole wreck. And in fact, if we, if it's not too late, I would love to get a view of what the 88 car saw because that Battle Beaver's Mustang, tell you what, he's going to need a new change of a race suit after this. I just find it funny that the 11 of David Cobb, he was, he was leading about seven, eight laps ago. He got tangled up in that. So, I mean, how things change here at Talladega, you go from leading, he fell all the way back to like 15th, 16th. And then he got swept up in a little bit of the mess. I don't know how much damage it got on that 11 machine, but just a little bit. Yeah, here's the Battle Beaver machine, Nolan. Watch him scramble low, Ooh. lower, lower, lower. Oh, oh. Almost to the inside wall. Oh, man. That's, uh, <laughs> this is some, uh, this is some Days of Thunder stuff. It's what you call using every single inch of the, uh, let's just say the pavement, because that ain't the racetrack down there. He is every single inch of the pavement all the way down to the inside wall. Now back in line again, inside. They're gonna start to wreck up the road. Nothing that David Cobb could have done there. And as they uh, slide off to the inside, straightening it out, still gets away with uh, some damage. Certainly could have been worse, but um, he does have some pretty substantial front end damage. You'll actually see his black number 11 Toyota as we uh, kind of trickle down into turn number one. There he is left hand side of the screen. You can see all those scratches on the front and of course um, the pretty significant bodywork damage um, that's going to put Cobb in a compromised position. Cobb's not going to be a leader. I don't think he's going to, you know, go to the race win. I don't think he's going to push somebody to the race win. He's just going to have to go with the hot hand. Uh, he's going to have to follow the cars that are drafted here and uh, just try to make it on through. Uh, more drivers towards the rear down pit road for fuel, many of which down for damage repair as well. But as we take the onboard perspective here, again, into the wreck, a couple of cars involved in... Uh, I would say maybe a little bit more than what I would classify as minor damage uh, on that one, able to go on through. But because of the uh, now second yellow, since everybody pitted at lap number 54, these drivers have had enough time to save fuel under the caution to be able to get some overtime out of this. I don't know if they've all got enough fuel to go three attempts. Because you're talking 10 to 15 extra laps if we're going to be running under that deep. So keep that in mind. If guys like Stanford, who is 100% good on fuel, having just pitted running in 25th position, ends up winning this thing. But uh, the guys up front have certainly saved enough to take a couple of cracks at it should we go beyond our scheduled distance. So under 10 to go, and if there was ever a time where it's time to get aggressive, now would very much be that time. It is worth noting that we are starting to burn a little bit of that daylight as well. You got the times to uh, modifier on, obviously, so the sun is tracking the sky, and you actually see it now starting to set closer and closer towards that turn one and two catch fancy. I don't think there's any risk we're going to find ourselves racing in the darkness, even if we end up using all three of our green white checkered attempts, but we wouldn't be too far off of it. Man, hey, you could see a Cinderella like David Reagan winning at a race like this, but you talk about aggression. I was aggressive 20 laps ago, Nolan. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but this right here is going to get big because you got you got Weinmeister up here, uh, Chris Rabel. He's worked his way up to six. Uh, Dean, uh, Sean Casto, he's up here uh, in ninth. And now, lo and behold, here's Brandon Six. He's in 11th. I mean, he's up 15 positions. You know, we really haven't talked a whole lot about him. He's led a couple laps, but nothing too major. He hasn't been a major player in this race so far. He's kind of bided his time. I think this is the time if he's going to make this move and go back-to-back -back wins, he's going to have to make this move in the next three laps, or uh, he's going to be trapped back here with the with the mayhem. 
And we had started to see over the course of that last run, this lead pack uh, fraction off, right? A couple of cars went off at one spin, a couple of cars checked off, fell back. We're all back in it. You have 33 race cars on the lead lap, all with just as good of a chance as every single guy next to him to win this Talladega 250. Pace car off and in, field in the hands of the number 94 Chevrolet of Agno Phillip, the driver out of Chicago, Illinois for A51 Pro, trying to put himself into the postseason here in 2022. He opts for the inside. He can start early, but is likely gonna wait to the exit of the restart zone as we look for the green flag, it's in the air. Seven laps to go. Seven to go. Agnel Phillip with the lead has yet to get a solid win this season, but looking for it now to try to pick one up on one of those tricky tracks to win a race at. Agnel Phillip with the lead. Whitemaster up top along with Kevin King trying to shove the number 48 car straight to the front, but it's not going to happen. Not through one and two. Jeremy Miller still holds the bottom as we're under 10 to go, coming to be six to go this next time by. And you see one car out to the outside. That's the 82 here. He's gonna go all the way back to the back. Major's gonna, he's not gonna get a whole lot of help. He's going about five, 10 miles an hour slower than this pack as they start to wind up here. Outside lanes getting so middle. Uh, you, you got the 31 of Kevin King. He's really getting on that back bumper, but be cautious here in the tri-oval. Get squirrely there. 13 was able to hold to the back bumper of Phillip. Uh, here we go, boys. They are asking for too much. They started to push and it really checked up the outside line and it's going to hurt them. Kevin King wants to leave that group altogether. Couldn't squeeze in between Casto and Hal. He'll have to stay on the outside line. So the inside, big ups off into turn number four, but that advantage is not gonna last long. Again, the outside is the place to be if you wanna move. The inside, the place to be if you wanna ride and defend. So here comes Winemaster alongside Rabel. Sheen gonna step up top, puts the bumper on him, and the 92 car now leads the outside line, coming to five laps to go. Oh, this can't last. The entire outside lane wobbles as they struggle to stay in line with Liam Sheen. Five to go. And Chris Rabel on a charge on the outside lane. Agna Villa comes up to try to block, but thinks better of it. Tucks back down in front of Jeremy Miller. Does not want to get caught in the sucker hole for the second time. There's another bobble from the 29 car. Sheen gives a fierce shove. Three wide now, deeper in the field. Oh, it's a betrayal. Liam Sheen abandons Rabel as soon as he was clear. Chuck into the inside line for the lead. Liam Sheen Whoa. ain't making no he turned him. He turned him. Sheen goes in front. Crash. There's everybody involved. At lap number 90, the big one strikes and the bad luck in 2022 continues for Agno Phillip as it was the number 94 car who went sideways first and we will go to real sim racing overtime here tonight in Talladega. We were watching this unfold down the back straightaway. It started with the move by Sheen, crossing over Rabel to get underneath, and then when Agno Phillip got pushed up and into it, he checked, Miller didn't, and that 13 hooked the 94 around and took a lot of really good race cars with him. Cobb was on top of a couple of people there and actually nearly went over as well. And that is the big, big problem that I was reiterating earlier in this race. If somebody blocks like that, there's nothing you can really do except try to open up another lane or you're gonna get run over yourself. But what can you do when you're on the inside lane? You can't obviously open up the lane down on the apron. That's never gonna happen. The only real option you have it's just hang on for the ride and hope to get around. But did Red McBride get through that? I'm sorry. Uh, I think that would that would that has to be against some kind of physics law there if the 15 got out of that unscathed. This was wild. I, I mean, this is the part of the race where the, the there is no lifting. You don't lift in this situation. You have to make a move. And that right there, you see Sheen. He comes down. He cuts that bottom lane off. 
and Philip did what he thought was the right move. He checked up just ever so slightly, and Miller wasn't having none of it. Miller didn't like, I'm sure he didn't like what Sheen did right there as we take a look at Rhett McBride going through this big old uh, mayhem here. He's right on the back bumper of somebody. Uh, beautiful looking forward. And then, oh my gosh, this is a big wreck. And he sure did. He sure did. No. That what is scary right there. You said it. I'd rather be lucky than good in a place like Talladega. And I think uh, no discredit to Rhett. It's a lot of luck in that. Sometimes it's meant to be. And he will stay in the conversation here in 12th. Let's watch it in slow-mo. Gets a bit of a bit of a touch there. But, I mean, at this point, you're thinking there's no way he's going to find a hole. And then the, uh, the 86 goes low. <laughs> Miller gets turned. He does turn away. Give him credit. He gets out of the way just in time. Some skill in there, too. But it just opened up for Rhett McBride to stay in this race. Is this the second big one he's missed in this race? I feel like we've talked about him earlier missing a wreck. That's, that's lucky and good at the same time. I don't know if that's just luck, but... If he don't win this race, he's <laughs> he's going to be disappointed. He's got the luck of Earnhardt right here. Hacks clearly to avoid a wreck like that. I mean, that goes beyond luck at that point in time. <laughs> Holy cow. It, it doesn't get much closer than that. The only way that could have been more impressive was if he had somehow been to the middle line, but you saw it in behind. There was quite literally no gap, and that gap that was there, existed for the one split second that McBride was there and as soon as he was gone it closed up Evan the I think that would have been a whole like of, cooler listen he's got a matte black paint scheme right on that VRS Direct Pro Sim 3D Chevy the only thing I can think of is that's the same black paint that they run on the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk it's just you can't see it on radar the Rex can't see it either he can just find a hole through. He slips under the radar, sneaks his way through, and Rep McBride's got a real good opportunity to earn some good points here tonight at Dega. We did lose, though, a lot of fast race cars with that incident. So I want to kind of update everybody on our SK Sim Racing leaderboard. Liam Sheen leading this race with Chris Rabel, Jaron Winemaster, Kevin King, and Sean Casto inside of the top five. Brandon Six, Dominic Howe, Brandon Bowie, William Schmidt, Michael Johnson, the drivers inside of the top ten. And speaking of Freedosh, this was his perspective on the inside. Similar situation to Brett McBride, screaming low, just gets around that, but I have to say, I think uh, I think McBride just wins out, but not by much. I think it'd been cooler if we had an onboard shot of him getting through that wreck. He had an ice cold Mountain Dew in his hand with the wavy mullet with the fan blowing on it, and he's just chugging a Mountain Dew, driving one-handed. I right there would have made it a, a, a true Talladega save. I feel like you're just describing uh, Colin Bowden all the time, anytime he's yeah. driving on the racetrack uh, in the Coke Series on a Tuesday night. And, and give Andrew some credit, too. When you go to the grass to avoid an incident like that, a lot of the time you're just kind of hitting the eject button when you go to the grass, right? You're almost accepting that you're going to turn the car into the grass. It's going to spin out, but you kind of hope it's a lazy spin and you get ahead of the incident. He went into the grass and didn't wreck it. That's going to help Freenosh out track position-wise. I know I recapped our top 10. Well, Freenosh will be starting in 11th position position for this one from the inside of row number six. I mean, you've got McBride, George, Johnson, Cruz, the top 15, Stanford, Major, Trudell, Harris, and Silver, your top 20. And behind him, still another dozen cars on the lead lap for 31 total. Quick pull with the lights out on top of the pace car, guys. Attempt number one. Is this the only attempt? No. No. No, universal consent is not going to make it around to the white flag. So we'll see if the racy to gods want to prove us wrong or if we've got even more in store here tonight from the Talladega Super Speedway. So the base car is going to dive off it in this time. Your control car is Sheen. That is the yellow and black number 92 Ford. 
who was elected to go to the outside line for the restart. Again, in RSR rules, pace car is clear. You can go now. You can see some checking up happening in the back of the field, but he doesn't want to go early because he doesn't want to be a sit and duck into one. So he's going to wait until we get all the way through that Geico restart zone until Barney the Flagman tells us to go, and we are underway. Sheen on the loud pedal is going to open up a gap in the run down to turn number one. Is it going to be too much of a gap, though? So Sheen's got a solid run down through turns one and two, trying to see if he can hold steady. Kevin Kane looking to give the bumper. How long, though, is that Team Chevrolet going to work with him? Cars wrecking in the background down low. Two, three. There's a fourth one involved. Is that going to be a yellow flag? It is not. Four cars collect him with their oval of the apron, and the caution is thrown. So green, white, jack on attempt number two. All of it. I told you it wasn't going to last long. Everybody back here. It started with the checkup there, and then a lot of drivers were really starting to get antsy through through this field. And you get a green-white checker to Talladega, you could be 22nd, and you could win this race. You have an opportunity as you see what happens here. They go three wide, uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of room there between those two cars, and his insurance rates are going up. That's the second one he's been in in that USAA machine. Uh, in the inside wall it goes. Didn't look like a whole lot of damage on that body either. Yeah, maybe not terminal for him. And listen, I think uh, taking the bet on that not being our only attempt at a finish uh, was uh, about as easy as a bet as taking the over on the anthem during the Super Bowl. It's always going to hit. Over is always going to hit. Green white checker number two is always going to happen. And to clarify, a long delay in the caution fly because the iRacing automatic caution system never threw a yellow for that one, right? They were all off the racing surface, so there was no caution from the sim. The initial incident was just Tim Johnson in the 56 and William Schmidt in the 79. If it stayed with just those cars, it would have been a two-car incident. There would not have been a yellow flag. However, because more drivers wrecked later on down the line, Eric Stanford, Bradley Burke. Then it was more than three cars. And per RSR rules, if there is more than a three-car incident, race control will manually throw the caution, even if the sim does not automatically trigger it. So that is the delay in the fact that race control opted to throw the caution flag in accordance with the rules. And that is why we head to an overtime attempt at number two. You watch it again. There is the first two off. When Stanford comes back up, he'll stay Burke with him. That is three and four. That is your grounds for the yellow. And that is why Liam Jean is pasted behind the pace car once more. If he wants a positive, I'll give it to him. That time by, he led his 29th lap of the race. So he has secured um, the most bonus points um, for most laps. Lot, I should say. So he has secured that extra bonus point. I caught most of that, so we'll see, uh, I guess, how the second attempt at a green white tracker will play on out. This could prove to be the more hectic of the two, because, of course, that one's at the middle of the pack, and that was just while well, we'll wait for some of the lead lap cars to try to get some around some of that slower traffic that was collected in that really big pile up that occurred in turn three on the last attempt. Now, I think we're a little bit more sorted as to where everybody's going to be sitting. I think now, though, the question will be, will we be seeing that third attempt being used? There are a maximum of three. After that, if a caution comes out, the race finishes behind the iRacing pace car. But so far, it doesn't look as though there's too many guys that are now have a lot of damage that are up here at the front of this field that aren't already up to speed. I don't think we'll be seeing a repeat of that problem then here on this restart. Are we allowed to pick winners here? Go for it. We can try. I'm going to go on a limb. And I'm going to say that Michael Johnson, who sits P8 in that 39, he's going to win this race in that Ford. Nolan, you got a, you, you feeling anybody? I'll have to wait until out of turn four. Then I might have three answers for you on that one. It's just too volatile for me to ever be able to pick one. Because every time I do, that tends to be the first driver that runs into struggles on one of these types of restarts. Yeah, you don't want to put the, uh, the commentator's curse on him, I assume. 
Mm, yes, exactly. I'll well, think, we've done that. I'll, let's do that. Listen, I've uh, I've jinxed my fair share of guys over the years, uh, so I'm also going to uh, neglect to uh, put that burden on somebody. But uh, I don't know. Just looking at it, I mean, I was going to be like, all right, maybe it's going to be a Chevy or Ford, but it, we're pretty even throughout the field. I mean, in the top ten, you've got two Fords, you got four Chevys, you got four Toyotas. That's a pretty even split there as well. Um, I would watch again for the teams, but I haven't seen a lot of teamwork recently. It it really appears like it's it's full on every man for himself. Yeah, I think that's what it is. But the reason I went with Michael Johnson is I I've been watching that 39 for the for the past couple laps, and every time he gets behind a driver, he's able to really give him a big shot. And I've seen a couple drivers in the Toyota camp that's able to really get him, you know, pulled out there ahead of the crowd. But when you see that 39 really make some moves, and he's got some fast drivers with him, Brandon Six, Chris Rabel, Kevin King, they're going to make some aggressive moves. And I can trust that Michael Johnson is going to be the one that's going to make it. He's going to come down to this start-finish line. I, I really think he's going to win this race. That Ford is, looks cleaner than every other car in front of him other than Kevin King. We're going to find out this will be attempt number two at a green to white checkered finish. Of course, three is the maximum. We we are not unlimited. There is a max, uh, but it'll be attempt number two. So attempt number two, William Machine once again has opted for the outside lanes. So I, I find this interesting. Usually people... Uh, see drivers choose the outside lane on restart, but especially a crucial one like this one, Terry. Yeah, it's it, Liam Sheen is is making the move that he can get down to the bottom, which he I'm sure he thinks is going to be the safest bet. But you've seen the front end of the Chevys and the Fords not really line with one another. You get a bit of a it used to have the rounder noses where if you get on the back bumper of somebody, it, it doesn't do good. But here we come to the line, Evan. It's uh, it's go time. And Sheen wants to be on the outside again. King underneath him for attempt number two at the restart. How long does the 92 wait? He went early last time. He goes early again. Green flag in the air. Two laps to go at Talladega. No one's really helping out the number 92 car, though. There's a large gap between himself and Sean Castro. Kevin King starting to push out but there's nowhere for him to go. So he's gonna have to give a shove to the back end of Liam Sheen. Will we keep it steady this time or will we find ourselves in attempt number three? It's so tight on the exit of turn two. Sheen jumps up high. Chris Rabel blocks low and Liam Sheen struggling to fend him off, but Rabel goes left and right and now to the race lead in turn three. Oh my gosh, I thought that was attempt number two of the green-white checkered, but it is not. We stay side by side through three and four. 29, a Rabel to the outside, Sheen to the bottom. Here comes Brandon Six to second. Six is going to be the pusher. They go into the dry oval a couple hundred more feet until this race is official. Rabel breaks out into the lead. It's six second, Sheen third, one lap to go. Final lap. Brandon Six in one and two. Rabel trying to spend them off. Out of turn four, that's where the move will come. While they're three wide, several zero behind. She makes the move for the lead. Sheen gets a run to the outside. He's got big help from King. He's all over, but will Sheen stay with him or does he go to the bottom as they come down the back straightaway for the final time into three and four? King's gonna push Liam Sheen to the race lead. They're both cleared out. Single file, top four and three and four. There's a lot of fast race cars trying to catch up, but it's Liam Sheen leading the 31 car of Kevin King to the trial bull. King to the outside. Rabel's gonna go with him. No help for Sheen underneath. End of the line. Kevin King wins in Talladega. And they crash across the start finish line. Freenosh got into it. I know Kyle Trudell got into it. Brandon Six lost a spot because of it. It got messy as they approached the line after a last minute block from Liam Sheen to keep the top five. But Kevin King takes it home. Rabel 
Gave him all the push that he needed to make that one work. And there was no more steam in that number 29 Mustang to be able to go for the win himself. Man, and that was just a classic Talladega finish. You see the 31 going to victory lane. That, that right there was a throwback to me. It felt like what Jeff Burton did when he was able to get around. Uh, and, and Clint Boyer as well when he took the 31 to victory lane. They had an opportunity. They took it. And the 92 just had nothing for him out there on the outside or the inside. When the outside got that run, he was gone. What a win for that boosted Chevrolet, man. That's, uh, that's a win for the ages as he backs her in the fence. It's one way to celebrate it for the team and Kevin King, a race winner here from Talladega in the full throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series. And of course, I talked about those that had success so far this year. Well, his teammate won the season opener on a plate track in Daytona and keeping it in the team is Kevin King, who finds victory here tonight in the Talladega 250. What a drive as he is going to continue the celebration all the way down pit road. And this one's going to go, I believe, well into the evening. We take a look at our SK Sim Racing full race results. Kevin King, by a tenth of a second, ends up on top of Chris Rabel and Liam Sheen in third. We'll talk with all of them in just a few moments. Andrew Frenosh ends up in the top five and fourth ahead of Brandon Six in P5. Kyle Trudell, Dane Cruz, Brandon Bowie, Rhett McBride, and Michael Jones. Johnson, your top 10. That'll put Thomas George in 11th with Cody Harris in 12th. It's Jaron Wymaster in 13th with Manasseh Major in 14th. Sean Casto is in 15th with Nick Silver in 16th. Sean Kalis is 17th. Ross Cato is 18th. Dominic Howe and Jeremy Miller are in 19th and 20th. You look right here in 21st, Timothy Johnson's right there in the Dizzy Motorsports Toyota with Eric Stanford. Uh, Riley Grant Davis down there in 23rd, Tom Whitmore in 24th, uh, Bradley Burke 25th, Matt Mara 26th, William Schmidt 27th, Car Chris Edwards in 28th, Michael Con Koncheski. Yep, I think that one was right too at 29th, and Michael Lara in 30th. And continuing on through the field in this one, you got Ewing, Kamer, Cobb, Philip, and Nieto, all a couple of laps down, uh, but the likes of Murano, Ross, and Chambliss, the drivers who DNF include DeBarro in 39th, Parrish in 40th, and at the very tail end of the field, Cohan and Danson, 41st and 42nd. That's a look top to bottom at your SK Sim Racing to full race results. SK Sim Racing is an iRacing team and channel with an emphasis on reaching those who are new to the oval sim racing world. You can find them online at facebook.com slash SK Sim Racing on Twitter at SK Sim Racing one and you can race what champions race by visiting skSimgear.com. Well, it is a win tonight for Kevin King and Nolan. You are trackside with the driver of the 31 Chevrolet. Indeed, I am Kevin King and driving it home to a race win today. And I, Kevin, I think you owe Mr. Rabel a beer after tonight, after he pushed you to a win on the season at Talladega. How does it feel to take the win at the biggest, baddest track on the NASCAR calendar? <laughs> it's uh, it's a miracle. I was telling those guys, I haven't won one of these things in like 10 years, I feel like, if not longer. I'm just, I'm not a big fan of super speed air racing. Um, typically never, never run well, but um, for whatever reason on this package, like you can do a lot more stuff um, and it allows you to, to be a little bit more patient and time your moves a little bit more aggressively when you need to so um yeah i mean i got lucky that i missed three wrecks um and just was in a really good position there and thankfully chris you know didn't go behind liam and push him and um, i side drafted liam pretty well uh pretty hardcore right there and he just pushed me by so um as always these things are pretty pretty luck based but um i'll finally take one of these things it was a very different race at the end in terms of the aggression we were seeing from drivers as opposed to the first half. Why don't you tell us from a driver's standpoint what kind of dictates how aggressive you are when it comes to these types of races? Because obviously it's about one of the most different types of races you can get out there. 
You know, for the first part, because I ran I ran um, NAS last night, so I kind of knew the fuel strategy, but um, you just have to log laps, and you don't necessarily need to be up front all the time. Um, as long as you're with the main pack, you can really just dictate um, your own race. You don't have to be up there. Um, so you just maintain the draft pit when everyone else does, and um, when you need to really ha hammer on it, like, you find someone that you can really push hard, um, and for whatever reason, like, they're their ability to just go faster is just it's just way larger um than than other people for some reason so you just kind of maintain that race i guess position um and then go when you need to and then just avoid all the wrecks so that's pretty much all i did and obviously with this latest win this is going to help your championship standing significantly you enter tonight's race 14th you're going to be leaving i imagine a fair bit higher do you have high hopes after tonight that you might be able to find your way in the playoffs by the time we get around towards the season's end yeah I, if you told me that my first win would be uh at a super speedway i'd probably laugh because it, it's just not something i think i looked up stats one time and i had like four total wins ever or something ridiculous um in my career of iRacing. racing but um yeah i think it helps you know it just um i i really enjoy this car um and it kind of suits my driving style i think um, so I look forward to racing it all the time, even at super speedways for crying out loud. So the ability for me to, to like the car, it helps my confidence a little bit. Um, and just being around, I mean, you got a really good group of drivers here, um, really respectful and all that fun stuff. So, um, I enjoy racing the car. I, I enjoy racing the people around me. So it just creates a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to it. And while we're looking forward to hopefully be seeing you up towards victory lane even more throughout the rest of the season, thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. King, and, well, best of luck next week at the Boston Mile. Thanks so much. I just want to give a quick shout-out to uh, Battle Beaver and Boosted and Tom for uh, putting that up together. Hopefully um, you all go check them out and get some goodies from them because they make some pretty cool stuff. That was Kevin King joining us up here in the broadcast booth from Victory Lane. And, well, it's time to uh, move it on down to the driver who helped push him up to the race win. And, Terry, you're standing by with our runner-up. Yo, Chris Rabel, what's up, man? It's Terry up here. How's it going, guys? Well, yeah, it's going pretty good. We got to watch a pretty awesome race and watched you push Kevin King up there to the win. Hey, what was this race like? There was a lot of chaos and... You had a little bit of, hey, we're going to hang out. And then it was like, no, let's go. Take the seatbelts off. Let's run for it. What was your mindset coming into this race? And how did you survive for second? Uh, first of all, I just wanted to give a shout out to all my partners, uh, Southern Creek Clothing. This is actually their home track. They're based out of Alabama. So I was able to represent them today. Uh, the Loop Podcast, High Banks Podcast, Elwood Designs, uh, Mar Racing Network, and my awesome team over at KIR Esports. Um, but the race in and of itself, man, these plate tracks have treated me pretty well so far. So I, can't, I knew I had a good shot at it. Um, just had to basically play the Talladega Lottery, if you will, and try and make it to the end. Um, it was going to be a two-stop race no matter what you did um, as far as fuel saving goes. So we were just kind of balls to the wall the whole way. Well, let me ask you. So last season, obviously, y'all didn't run the next-gen car. But coming here to a plate track in this, what was the different style like? Did you have to make different moves in what you made in the Gen 6 car? Or was this just the same kind of concept that you knew that you had to race the, the other people around you harder? Uh, I, what, did, what did you do different? The concept in and of itself is the same. You just got to do things a little bit differently. One, the side draft is still strong, but it's not nearly as strong as the old car, in my opinion. Uh, secondly, the runs in this car are massive. So you have split seconds to make the decisions on whether to block, what to do with your run. Uh, you just got to worry about that. Um, but that's the main thing. The runs is the big thing. Well, we go, we went from dirt to Dega, to Dover. There's a lot of Ds in there, but what what are you looking forward to at Dover? The Monster Mile has been known to chew a lot of people up. Is he going to chew you up, or are you going to go out there and knock him one in the mouth? Well, now that we've got a top 10 at Bristol, second place here is going to be the kick in the pants. I think we need to get this season rolling, so I'm looking for the same here at Dover next week. I'm hoping for another top 10. Well, let's go out there. I'm not going to pick you because my pick finished 10th. I want you to pick a little a little higher than that. But good luck, Chris. <laughs> uh, <laughs> get out there. We'll see you next time. Congrats on P2 tonight. Uh, take it easy, guys. Thanks. And Mr. Nolan, pretty sure you got Liam Sheen, the man who uh, was only about, what, 100 feet from the start-finish line of winning this one? 
Indeed he was, and Liam Sheen had to throw a last bit of block just to hang on to the podium, and Liam, not the way you wanted that restart to go, but you still managed to finish up your third step on the podium. Why don't you walk us through those last two laps? Uh, I was just kind of coordinating with those around me, um, those people who I knew. Um, I was trying to get a little bit of brownie points there um, with some people around here, so um, just trying to see who I could help, who could... Um, you know, obviously, I'm not really, like, full-time. Um, but obviously, if I could sneak out one, I was trying to uh, uh, do that and probably or possibly get in the playoffs. But, yeah, we'll have to win a road course. But, um, yeah, uh, I was just trying to coordinate with those around me. And then I was um, getting that jump so I couldn't get, like, beat by the high side. Because if you get beat by a high side on a restart, you're losing maybe five, six, seven positions. Whereas, like, as we saw with um, Chris Brandon and... Uh, I think it was the 52 car. Uh, they were all, um, it was only three spots. So I, that I can work with. I can't work with six cars or six spots lost. So I was just trying to go early, get the jump, get down ahead of someone I knew and uh, get the push from them. So it could just be between us two. So that's what I ended up doing. And um, yeah, uh, not, on the, not on the better end of it, but uh, that's how it goes sometimes. Of course, uh, the team certainly not having as much bigger representation as some of the other teams like Cupid and Real, Peak Performance and others. At a racetrack where teamwork is certainly everything, what was it like having to go up against some of those giants out there from the Real Sim Racing League? Well, I'm independent, so um, I was kind of just on my own. Um, uh, I was teammates with Kevin and uh, trying to get a little bit of brownie points. Hopefully he'll add me back to his Discord server, but... Uh, um, yeah, I was just trying to work with those I knew, um, but I'm pretty much, you know, lone soldier in this league uh, for Nexus. Um, I guess Sam, uh, if you count him, but he's with a kind of a league team, so I'm just kind of, just kind of winging it on my own up here. So I'm just chilling. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's tough to stay ahead of the team games, but um, when you can, um, when you have the track position on restarts, it's easy to kind of just, you know predict of what's going to happen if it happens it happens if it doesn't you know that sucks but yeah it's kind of a uh, difficult and of course you mentioned that you're more of a part-time driver when it comes to this league nowadays are we going to be seeing you out of the monster mile and well if we are what's your thoughts coming over into dover um probably not um i'm not sure what my next race is going to be kind of what tickles my fancy um i'll probably um you know, I'll probably run all the road courses, try to give Matt Danson a run for his money. Uh, came close at Coda, and I threw it away. So um, hopefully you can give him a better run for his money. At, I think it's Road America next. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll, you'll definitely see me at the road courses. And then whatever, you know, you know, pops up along the way, maybe I'll run there, make a start here or there. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> And well, in that case, thank you, Liam, for taking the time to join us here tonight. And well, hopefully we'll be seeing you in victory lane or even just on the podium a couple of more times before the season is over yet. Thank you. Uh, Got to thank all the uh, guys at Nexus Esports, uh, V-Speed. Uh, they sponsored me for Road to Pro. Um, on the broadcast, that has my FTF banner, but I promise you it has uh, the RSR banner. Evan, please don't penalize me. And uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> And thank you, Lee, for taking the time to join us. And, well, I think that is going to be about it then for the driver interviews then here tonight. And, well, Evan, all passes on back down to you. Well, first, a big thanks to all the drivers uh, for giving us a little bit extra time post-race to break down some of the craziness um, that was, yet again, another night at Talladega. And, listen, I mean, you look at the numbers, right? I got five cautions on my count. That's not bad for Talladega, but don't let that fuel you. Uh, that does not mean that this was not a crazy race, right? We had everything, long runs, green flag pit stops, big wrecks, and an exciting finish. Nolan, I'll go back to you first on this one. I mean, I don't think there's much more we could have asked for. Uh, no, I wouldn't say so either, it's short of an actual photo finish, but hey, last lap pass in the trial. Well, would it really be a proper Talladega race without it? 
And of course, you know, we mentioned that guys need to start picking it up. You heard it there from your second to place finisher uh, in this one, Terry, trying to roll some momentum, put a good program here together. Kevin King got his first win now, 82nd different winner to ever do it here in the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series. So those people who we kind of called out at the very start of the night, right? Middle of the year, you got to start making steps forward. I think a lot of people did so tonight and the Monster Mile is going to be a tricky place to continue momentum into because that's going to be a hard fought one. Well, and for Kevin King, he's going to go in there with a ton of momentum. And when we started the show saying that this could be an opportunity in a five race stretch with different racetracks on the horizon that you could make a statement here tonight. And Kevin King did that. He stayed up front. He stayed out of the trouble. Liam Sheen did good, but obviously he's part time. You know, he, he's going to sit and come back for the road courses. But that was a statement win for that 31. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him next week go up there and really put a challenge on him because now he can drive caution free. He, he, he got nothing to worry about. He's he's in. Like, stay out. Like, do something crazy. Yeah, we've seen him find victory lane many good times in the winter series. He has now done it here in the Cup Series. Until next time, though, that is it for us here tonight from the virtual Talladega Super Speedway. So on behalf of our entire team at Real Sim Racing, Race Bot TV, and for our partners at SK Sim Racing and your broadcast team tonight. For our producer downstairs, Tyler Maxid, for Terry, Terry Radford, Nola Rempel, and myself, Evan Pasoko, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and congratulate Kevin King, who is a winner in the RSR Cup Series. We're back next week. That is Monday, May the 2nd for the virtual Dover Motor Speedway. That race and every race of the 2022 Full Throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series can be found exclusively here on Race Spot TV. Till next time, good night from Talladega, where Kevin King is in victory lane.